This audiobook was created using text-to-speech software, and was not read by a real person. Please keep in mind the limitations of the technology when it comes to pacing and pronunciation. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the story. Star Wars Jedi Apprentice Book 17 The Only Witness Written by Jude Watson Audiobook Adaptation by YJK Audiobooks Preview After losing the woman he loved, Qui-Gon finds it difficult to continue as a Jedi Knight. When he and Obi-Wan are sent to a hostile planet, to protect the only witness willing to testify against an evil crime family, the two Jedi are soon entangled in a violent web of power, corruption, and lies. Chapter 1 Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn sighed deeply as he strode down the hall. The Council felt he had been inactive for too long, and he knew it. They had been patient as he mourned the death of his dear friend, Tahal. And now, they were waiting for him to decide he was ready to resume his active life as a Jedi. Except, he wasn't. And he was not sure he ever would be. Qui-Gon turned a corner, heading for the council room. The council had summoned him, but hadn't explained why. Perhaps they had grown tired of waiting. Perhaps they were going to send him on a mission anyway. Maybe it is for the best, Qui-Gon thought, trying to make himself believe it. He'd been attempting to convince himself of so many things lately, though he did not often succeed. And at least it will be good for Obi-Wan. Qui-Gon's Padawan walked noiselessly beside him, his face a mask of perfect calm. Qui-Gon knew what lurked underneath. He could feel the tension growing between him and his apprentice. He sensed that Obi-Wan wanted to speak, and yet he was uncharacteristically silent. Though Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan had never been far apart over the last few months, in many ways Qui-Gon had deserted his apprentice. He wished he could say something to reassure Obi-Wan. Soothing speeches used to come so easily. But Jedi wisdom felt somehow hollow to him now. He would not offer the boy empty words. Pausing outside the council room, Obi-Wan turned to his master. Qui-Gon saw he was about to speak, but before he could say anything the council room doors hissed open. Only three of the twelve council seats were filled. Qui-Gon was not surprised to see so few members present. He greeted his old friends and stood before them in the familiar circle. Yoda, Mace Windu, and Plo Koon thanked the Jedi team for coming. Their eyes passed briefly over Obi-Wan, then rested on Qui-Gon. They were obviously concerned. Qui-Gon could feel the council members looking deep inside him, trying to determine if sending him on a mission was the right decision. He was surprised to find that he could not hold their gaze. Rather than lifting his burden of sorrow, their caring made him painfully aware of the weight he was bearing. Looking past the seated masters to the Coruscant skyline, Qui-Gon tried to settle his feelings. He wondered yet again, why he could not let this flood of emotion flow through him. He had been taught to do just that by great teachers, some now seated before him, and it had always worked. Yet, it did not work now. Obi-Wan shifted his feet, and Qui-Gon realized that the silence had gone on for too long. We've received a request from Senator Crota Frago, Mace Windu began at last. He has asked for Jedi assistance in transporting a witness to Coruscant to testify before the Senate. Qui-Gon nodded. Protecting important witnesses was routine for the Jedi. As he'd suspected, this first mission would be a simple assignment, something easy. A distraction. That was why there were only three members of the council present. A simple task it is not, Yoda said, as if in answer to Qui-Gon's thoughts. There is much danger on Frego. Mace Windu continued to study Qui-Gon's face. We would not send you if we did not think you were ready. Do you feel ready, Qui-Gon? Qui-Gon did not know. He had no desire to leave the temple, or even his simple rooms. 
but it would not be fair to Obi-Wan, to live in seclusion forever. I am ready, Qui-Gon replied, more firmly than he believed. Qui-Gon could feel Obi-Wan's relief. It rushed from him like a breath that had been held for a long time and finally released. The council members too, seemed to relax upon hearing Qui-Gon's words. They stopped searching his thoughts. They had the answer they wanted. Qui-Gon hoped he had made the right decision. As Yoda said, the situation is complicated, Plo Koon said. We've asked Jocasta Nu to give you all of the information you need before you depart. He gestured toward the temple archives. Go now, you must, Yoda added gravely. We fear, the danger for the witness is growing. The sooner you get to Frego, the better, May said, dismissing Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan with a wave of his hand. May the Force be with you. Qui-Gon nodded, and walked slowly out of the circular room, followed by Obi-Wan. Even after hearing the Master's cautionary words, he felt sure that the mission would be simple to complete. As long as his spirit, didn't fail him. Jocasta knew, was a thin wispy Jedi, with long graying hair that she wore in a tight bun. She stood up from her work table the moment the Jedi entered the room. The picture of efficiency, she gathered her materials and gestured toward another larger table, asking Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan to take a seat. I understand that time is of the essence, Jocasta said. She did not bother with introductions. It did not matter. Qui-Gon had encountered the temple archivist before, and surely Obi-Wan knew who she was. She briefed many Jedi teams before they went out on important missions. In the past Qui-Gon had preferred to use other sources to get his information. He had grown used to working with Tahal, and hadn't met with Jocasta that often since he took Obi-Wan as an apprentice, four years ago. The witness is Lena Cobral. Jocasta showed them a hollow image of a slight young woman with dark hair, twisted into an elaborate bun. She is the widowed wife of Rutin Cobral. The image of the young woman vanished and a man appeared in her place. He was young, fairly tall, with short brown hair and a relaxed smile. Rutin was recently killed, and his murderer is still at large. Is that unusual? Qui-Gon asked. I thought Frego was a planet ruled by criminals. Jocasta looked slightly annoyed at the interruption, but continued. The Cobral family is the largest power on Frego. They are in charge of a crime ring that has successfully controlled the government for 20 years. Rutin's father died a few years ago, of natural causes. It was widely believed that Rutin was being groomed to take over, although he has two brothers who are older than he is. Solon is the oldest, and the new leader of the Cobral. A shorter, stockier version of Rutin appeared on the screen. Besides his brother's height, Solon also lacked his thick head of hair and genuine smile. He was nearly bald and his scowl looked permanent. Solon is well known on his planet, widely feared and respected. He gets what he needs through threats, violence, and influence. Now that Jocasta was through imparting information, she was prepared to answer Qui-Gon's question. It is not unusual for murders to go uninvestigated on Frego. But it is unusual for a favored member of the Cobral family to be killed, particularly without vengeance. Though Qui-Gon's expression did not change, he felt a fresh wave of grief wash through him. He longed more than ever, for Tahal. For her cynicism, her quick mind, and her habit of dispensing information in a way that naturally led Qui-Gon's thoughts in the proper direction. Qui-Gon reminded himself that theirs was a relationship that had taken years to develop. And that the connection he had with Tahal was one he would never have with the Temple Archivist. Or anyone else, probably. Lena married into the Cobral family three years ago, Jocasta went on. There was a rumor that Rutin no longer wanted to be involved in his family's dealings. Although he could not easily divorce himself from the crime business, Senator Crote has told us that Rutin was prepared to testify before the Senate against his family. He wanted to put an end to the crime ring altogether. Not long after Rutin agreed to testify, he was killed. 
Jocasta took a breath, but did not allow more than a second to pass before going on. Last night, we received a secret communication from Lena. Senator Crote did as well. She has decided to take up her husband's cause and testify against the Cobral herself. Jocasta pushed several documents on a data pad across the table toward the Jedi. Everything you need is here. Qui-Gon stood and took the data pad. Thank you, he said curtly. We may be contacting you if we need further assistance. Of course, Jocasta nodded. May the Force be with you. Qui-Gon nodded blankly in return. How could he trust that the Force would be with him? Where had it been when he'd needed it the most? He and Tahal had pledged their love for each other. But nothing, not that love, not the Jedi, not the Force, had been able to save her. It did not take long for Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan to gather supplies for the short journey. Soon they were stepping onto the freighter that would take them to Frego. Distracted and exhausted, Qui-Gon was anxious to retire to his quarters as soon as they were on board. He was about to say as much to Obi-Wan when his Padawan spoke. Master, I know that these last few months have been hard on you. Obi-Wan reached out a hand toward Qui-Gon's shoulder but let it drop, barely brushing his master's brown sleeve. And I, well, I can't help remembering what you told me, when Bant was missing in the temple. You said that the darkest time, is the time when it is most important that you follow the Jedi Code. If you let your emotions. Thank you, Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon cut him off. You have learned well what I've taught you. One day you will make a fine Jedi Master. He turned, and made his way quickly toward his quarters. He could sense the boy behind him, standing, bewildered. Qui-Gon knew his apprentice was only trying to make him feel better. But he could not bear to listen to the wisdom, that was now failing him. He simply wanted, to be alone. Chapter 2 Obi-Wan stood silently, watching the planet Frago, grow larger on the freighter's view screen. Qui-Gon had not emerged from his quarters during the journey. Obi-Wan was not sure if he should disturb him, even now that they were drawing close to their destination. He desperately wanted to give Qui-Gon the same comfort his master had given him, so many times. But the more he tried, the further Qui-Gon retreated. The gulf between them seemed to be growing wider, and Obi-Wan was at a loss. How could he span the distance alone? That must be Frago. Qui-Gon's voice surprised Obi-Wan, and filled him with relief. He would not have to disturb his master's solitude after all. And that glowing spot must be the capital city of Rian, Qui-Gon continued. Obi-Wan could tell that Qui-Gon was still sad and distracted. It was almost like standing beside a ghost. But at least he was speaking. He was making an effort. As they exited the craft, Obi-Wan felt on edge. It was up to him to focus on this mission. He could not depend on his master in his emotionally wounded state. Obi-Wan did not think the Cobral family had been alerted to their arrival, but a planet ruled by criminals was always a dangerous place. He half expected to see dark dealings and black market bargains right in the freighter hangar, but there was only one person present as the Jedi disembarked, and she looked at them without interest. Obi-Wan relaxed a little, until the freighter captain slid down the ramp toward him. I'll be taking off as soon as possible, if that's okay, he said nervously. I don't want to spend any more time here than is absolutely necessary, with the Cobral Airways tax and all. Obi-Wan nodded. Though he did not know exactly what the pilot was referring to, he could tell it was not pleasant, and most likely not legal. He thanked the captain for their safe passage and watched him slip back inside his craft. As soon as the ship's door shut, the lone woman in the hangar approached the Jedi. I trust you had a pleasant journey, from. She paused. Coruscant, Obi-Wan finished for her. Are you Lena? No, the woman said, lowering her hood to reveal closely cut hair and a youthful face. I am Micah, but I will take you to Lena now. Micah glanced around the hangar once more. She's nervous, Obi-Wan thought. 
He drew a deep breath and concentrated on the force. But he did not sense danger, only Micah's fear. Follow behind me, but not too close. If I am approached I will pretend not to know you. Micah's eyes were large and dark and she turned them on Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan in turn, waiting for each to nod in agreement. We will do as you ask, Obi-Wan assured her. Raising her hood, Micah started out of the hangar at a brisk pace. Obi-Wan enjoyed being introduced to a new planet on foot. Qui-Gon had taught him that the slower pace was best for observation, and there was much to observe in Rian. None of it was what Obi-Wan had expected. The streets were clean. The footpaths were filled with fragans carrying colorful bundles, and walking unhurriedly together. Just a short distance from the municipal hangar, stalls lined the paths food vendors sold heaps of fresh fruits and vegetables, meats, and grains, shouting out prices and greeting regulars. Farther into the open market more vendors sold household goods and even crafts. Everywhere people seemed happy and relaxed. In the heart of the market the crowd was so dense and there was so much to see that Obi-Wan nearly lost sight of Micah. But whenever he looked up he saw Qui-Gon's eyes trained on the gray peak of Micah's hood. He did not seem to be taking in the surroundings as he normally would. His thoughts were clearly elsewhere. Obi-Wan would have liked to discuss his observations with his master. Wasn't it unusual that a planet controlled by criminals would have such a seemingly happy populace? But he was quite sure Qui-Gon wasn't thinking about the Fragans, so he kept quiet. At last the market stalls ended and the crowd thinned. After following Micah through a maze of dark but clean alleys, the woman stopped and beckoned the Jedi toward her. When they drew close Micah punched a control pad and a large warehouse door groaned open to reveal a huge room filled with abandoned equipment. We're here, Micah said, waving the Jedi in first and taking a last look up and down the alley before shutting the door. I am the only one who knows where Lena is hiding. Besides you. It is important that you are never followed to this spot. Of course. Obi-Wan nodded. At the top of several flights of Durasteel stairs, the yawning spaces and hulking machinery gave way to a more hospitable living space. Standing with her back to the entrance, among several mismatched but comfortable-looking couches, was the woman Obi-Wan had seen on Jocasta News Holoscreen. Lena Cobral. Micah cleared her throat to announce their arrival. Lena turned. You've made it, she said, bringing her hands together and offering both of them to Qui-Gon and then Obi-Wan, and finally embracing Micah. I'm so pleased. Was your journey very difficult? It passed quickly, Qui-Gon told her before introducing himself and Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan was glad that Qui-Gon had emerged again from silence, for he was not entirely sure he would have been able to manage the conversation so easily. Lena Cobral had been attractive on the hollow screen, but in person she was stunning. Her long dark hair spilled over her shoulders, framing her face and dark eyes like Micah's. She was only a few years older than Obi-Wan, which surprised him. Like the Fragans in the street, her demeanor was relaxed. She greeted the Jedi as if they were old friends or honored guests at a party, not political escorts. Please sit, Lena said, guiding the Jedi to the chairs. You need refreshment. Perhaps some kopi tea. Before the Jedi could protest Lena was pouring a warm dark liquid into cups. It looked slightly orange and tasted delicious. My cousin Micah brings me everything now that I am in hiding. Lena smiled at the silent Micah. She brought me this tea yesterday. And today she has brought you to me as well. Lena turned her infectious smile on the Jedi, Obi-Wan found that it was nearly impossible not to smile back. She is too good to me. Lena's upbeat voice gave no clue that there was any real threat. She insists on staying with me without any thought of the danger to herself. I know I should not allow it. You are the one who does not give any thought to putting yourself in danger, Micah said softly. As Lena watched her cousin stand and leave the room, Obi-Wan thought he caught a first glimpse of tension and fear on her face. He looked at Qui-Gon to see if he too had noticed it, 
but Qui-Gon had retreated inside himself once more and was gazing into his teacup. I'm sorry, Lena apologized, suddenly placing her hand to her brow. I'm wasting your time, and I have not been entirely honest. Obi-Wan sat up and Qui-Gon placed his cup on the table. They did not speak, but waited for Lena to continue. It is true that I need an escort to Coruscant. And it is true that I wish to testify against the Cobra. I must complete the task that Rutin started. The task he died for. Lena's voice caught and she stood, turning toward the shrouded windows before continuing. In so many ways, it is my fault. I did not mean to fall in love with him. I did not know he was a Cobra. But love isn't a choice, is it? Obi-Wan thought he saw Qui-Gon nod slightly. Before we married, Rutin promised he could stop the crime, but he could not stand to be cast out of his family. He was his parents' favorite and he loved them. He hoped that he could convince them to change their ways. He was not content to remove himself, he wanted to stop it all. Lena spoke more quickly as she went on, as if she could not stop the flow of words. But then his brother Solon found out that Rutin was trying to change things. Furious, he went to their father. Rutin could not close the crime ring from the inside. So he decided to try to close it from the outside. It was the hardest decision he ever made. I wanted him to get out, but I begged him not to risk his life. He insisted. For me, he said. He did it for me. Lena paused again and turned back toward the Jedi. Her dark eyes were moist with tears. Obi-Wan felt she was looking only at him, and her eyes bore straight into his heart. It was as if she were searching him, checking to see if he had the strength, and courage, to help her. If he could be trusted. Obi-Wan knew instinctively that he trusted her. There was something about the way she carried herself, about the way she spoke. She was not lying to them. He could sense her fear, yes, but also her honesty. And he could feel her strength. Lena Cobral was not a coward. That is why I must carry out his plan, Lena said, straightening. I can't let Rutin's death be for nothing. I will testify, I will stop the crime. But. Obi-Wan leaned in. So far the story was as he expected. But what? I don't have any solid evidence to bring before the Senate. Lena sighed. Rutin worked very hard to protect me. Although I have heard many things, as all Fragans have, I have only my word against theirs. Qui-Gon stood. Obi-Wan could tell by the look on his face that he was not happy about being fooled. They were sent to escort a witness in danger and now it seemed their witness had no testimony. Please, Lena said, taking Qui-Gon's large hand. I beg you, stay until I have the proper evidence. I know it exists, lists and dates, accounts and records of the Cobral's crimes. With your help. We were sent only to protect you. If you cannot testify, we must return to Coruscant alone, Qui-Gon said flatly. Obi-Wan flushed, unable to believe what he was hearing. How could Qui-Gon deny this woman, help? Chapter 3 Master, Obi-Wan said, more sharply than he'd intended. I. He stopped, realizing that it would not be good to discuss their differing opinions in front of Lena. I would like to speak with you, he finished. Obi-Wan nodded to Lena, and walked quickly toward the stairs and down one flight. Qui-Gon's footsteps followed. When he reached the landing, Obi-Wan whirled. Master, you can't mean to leave this woman here. She is obviously scared and in danger, he burst out. She lied to us about having evidence, Obi-Wan. Who's to say she is not lying about the danger as well, Qui-Gon said calmly. Her fear is real, Obi-Wan said. Surely you can feel that. We cannot abandon her. His face felt warm. He had not spoken so strongly to his master since before Tahal's death, but since then Qui-Gon seemed to feel nothing outside of himself. Qui-Gon gazed at his Padawan for some time. 
Obi-Wan did not look away. He would not allow Qui-Gon to walk away from this. We can stay for two days, that is all. If she does not have the evidence by that time we will return to Coruscant without her, Qui-Gon decided. But I do not think this is a good idea. You are letting your emotions guide you. I will not regret it, Obi-Wan said tightly. That is my hope, his master replied. Anger and frustration welled up inside Obi-Wan. He started back up the stairs without another word. Hadn't Qui-Gon let his emotions guide him in the past? If only his master would allow himself to feel some of those emotions now he would understand. They were making the right decision. Lena, and Frago, needed them. Struggling to let go of his frustration, Obi-Wan paused before re-entering the living quarters. Lena heard the Jedi on the stairs and turned. Her face was full of hope. We will stay two days, Obi-Wan told her with a smile. We will protect you while we are here, but that is all. We will not gather evidence against the Cobral, Qui-Gon added. It was enough. Lena threw her arms around Obi-Wan's neck. Thank you, she said in his ear. Thank you. It is more than I can ask. Obi-Wan felt his face and neck grow warm, as he hugged Lena back awkwardly. Out of the corner of his eye he saw Qui-Gon and, behind him, Micah. Neither of them were smiling. Two days will be plenty, but there is no time to waste, Lena said. She dashed from the room and returned a moment later with a robe similar to Micah's. She quickly coiled her hair and pinned it on her head before covering it with a hood. I'm coming with you, Micah stated. Lena shook her head. There's no reason to put you in danger too. Obi-Wan thought he saw a flicker of annoyance in Micah's expression, but she was silent as the Jedi and Lena left the apartment. Lena's manner was very brusque and her expression one of pure determination as she led the Jedi outside into the alley. Obi-Wan noticed her brows were drawn before she covered them with a pair of dark goggles that hid most of her face. Lena moved through the streets even faster than her cousin. She led the Jedi from the dark, towering warehouses to a neighborhood filled with tall, sparkling buildings. Bubble-like turbolifts silently glided up and down their outside walls. Lena came to an abrupt halt a dozen meters away from a particularly large and grand-looking building. Three imposing men stood on guard outside the bubble turbolift. We'll have to go in the back way, Lena said, finally turning toward the Jedi. She sighed sadly. I haven't been back to my apartment since. Your apartment, Qui-Gon interrupted. Obi-Wan guessed that his master was not entirely surprised about their destination, but that he didn't think going inside was a good idea. Obi-Wan wasn't sure it was, either. But he wanted to help Lena. Are you certain that's wise, Qui-Gon finished. We have no choice, Lena explained. There's vital information inside. I needed to testify. Qui-Gon did not reply as Lena turned and made her way down a narrow alley to a back entrance. Luckily this one was not guarded. Lena punched a code into a small panel and the door slid open. But there was no turbo lift on this side of the building. They had to walk up 37 flights of stairs. By the time they reached the top floor, all of them were out of breath. But Lena did not pause to rest. Instead she led them around a corner to what looked like a Duracrete wall. It wasn't until he got up close that Obi-Wan realized it was actually a concealed door. Lena pressed a small button concealed inside a panel, and the door slid open. Before Obi-Wan could even get a look inside, Lena gasped and put a hand to her mouth. They were standing in what had once been a beautiful parlor. But the apartment had been ransacked, and piles of debris littered the floor. Everything was ruined. The rich fabrics that had covered the furniture were torn to shreds and strewn across the rooms. Tables and bureaus were smashed. Drawers were overturned and shelves cleared, their ripped and broken contents randomly spread across every surface. The apartment had been lavishly decorated, but now it looked like the inside of a garbage scow. Whoever was responsible for the ransacking had done a thorough job. 
even the carpets had been pulled up and hacked to pieces. Beside him, Lena leaned heavily on Obi-Wan's arm. I should have guessed that they would search, she said, for Lorne. She leaned down and picked up the pieces of a small stone carving. She turned them over in her hand, and her eyes welled with tears. Obi-Wan wanted to comfort her, but wasn't sure what to say. He squeezed her arm gently. I suppose you should be glad you weren't at home, Qui-Gon replied dryly. He obviously hadn't noticed Lena's expression, and Obi-Wan felt a flash of annoyance. How could his master be so insensitive? Lena drew a deep breath and let go of Obi-Wan before picking her way carefully through the mess toward the back of the apartment. Qui-Gon stayed near the lift doors. Obi-Wan followed close behind Lena, in case she needed his support again. The apartment did not look like it had been searched so much as destroyed. Her face full of sadness, Lena surveyed the damage. She paused once to pick up a trinket that was not entirely shattered, then placed it on a shelf still barely attached to the wall. Obi-Wan wondered how long it would stay there before sliding off. How strange, Lena exclaimed as she walked into her bedroom, at the end of a long hall. Nothing in this room had been touched. The furnishings stood upright. The bed was made. Even the portrait on the wall was straight. Obi-Wan stepped closer to the portrait. It was a picture of Lena and Rutin. They stood together in front of a waterfall, their eyes locked on each other. Something about the portrait disturbed Obi-Wan, but before he could place the feeling, the portrait and the wall it was on swung aside to reveal a small office. It's where Ru Tin worked in the evenings, Lena explained, walking through the secret door. All of his family files are stored here. I just can't believe that whoever searched the house didn't. Lena trailed off, as she activated the computer screen. Blue light and horror shone on Lena's face as a message flashed on the screen. You cannot stop us. You can only die, trying. Chapter 4 Qui-Gon entered the back room, just in time to see the message flash a final time. Then the computer went dead. Lena sank into a chair. They've erased the evidence, she said. They've erased everything. For a moment, Lena's determination was replaced by desperation. Qui-Gon was surprised to feel a similar desperation, coming from Obi-Wan. He gazed at him thoughtfully. This was unusual behavior for his Padawan. Qui-Gon turned his attention to the matter at hand. Was the computer connected to a network of some kind, he asked. I don't think so, Lena said. Then she shook her head firmly. No. Ru Tin would not have kept the information here if it was. And no one else had access to the information, Qui-Gon questioned. Well, the information was no secret within the family. They all know what's going on, but they are careful not to leave a trail. Solon makes sure of that. Lena stood up and walked back into her bedroom, talking more to herself than the Jedi. Still, Rutin managed to construct a trail. Any of them could, but Solon. Qui-Gon could see that Lena was already recovering from the setback. She was formulating a new plan. Qui-Gon could not help but admire her resolve. And yet, if she loved her husband as she claimed, she was remarkably strong in the aftermath of his death. He thought perhaps she was deceiving them. They all know, Lena said again, louder. And one of them might just help. Lena turned and began picking her way back toward the lift. Come on, she beckoned the Jedi. I may need your protection even more now. We're going to the Cobral estate. Really? Qui-Gon asked. Are you sure that's the best plan of action? Only my mother-in-law lives there now. She's not part of the family business. Taking the risk will be worth it. It has to be. In the basement of the building, Lena and the Jedi climbed into a large landspeeder. Within moments they were zipping outside the city, toward the home of Lena's mother-in-law, Zanita Cobral. We've always gotten along, Lena explained as they skimmed the surface of the planet. 
Ru Tin was her favorite son. He was the youngest. Losing him was devastating for her, for all of us. Qui-Gon had trouble focusing his attention on Lena from his seat in the rear. As he forced himself to stay present, in the back of his mind he wondered if coming on this mission had been a bad idea. It called for subtle judgments he wasn't certain he was equipped to make. He felt as if he was moving through a fog of unclear emotions. Zenita may be the only person on the planet who is not under Solon's thumb, Lena said to Obi-Wan. She's the only one who can help. I just hope she wants to. The Cobral estate sat on a high ridge, overlooking Rian. When the large home was within sight Lena activated a transparisteel roof, which quickly covered the travelers. Then she pushed another button and the transparisteel turned a dark shade of gray. When we reach the gate, you'll have to duck down, Lena said. The Cobrals don't like strangers. Qui-Gon wondered how much the Cobrals would like seeing Lena. Even though she'd said that she and her mother-in-law were on good terms, her presence might stir things up rather than settle them. At least they had someone to remind them of Rutin. But who did Qui-Gon have to remind him of Tahul? No one had known her as he had. Fresh memories came to him every day. There was no one to share them with. Crouched in the back and covered by his own robe, Qui-Gon felt Lena tense. He could tell it was not just apprehension about the meeting with Zenita. Something else was happening. That Solon speeder, she whispered to the Jedi. And his brother Bards. The whole family is here. Qui-Gon raised his head enough to see a number of luxury vehicles parked in the bay outside the mansion. There was no doubt that the Cobrals possessed extraordinary wealth. Maybe we should come back later, Obi-Wan suggested gently from the front seat. No. I don't have time, Lena said with her familiar resolve. We'll sneak in, and I'll find a way to get Zanita alone. Or maybe I'll find what I need on my own and we won't need her help after all. We might be able to get additional information. Having several of the Cobrals present, could turn out to be a good thing. Or, a deadly one, Qui-Gon thought. Lena parked her speeder at the far end of the row, next to a metal statue. We can get in through the galley, she said, motioning with her head toward a small entrance. Qui-Gon watched as Lena and Obi-Wan moved silently into position by the galley door. Moments later a cooking servant emerged. He did not notice as Lena slipped her foot into the door, preventing it from closing. When the servant rounded the edge of the building, Qui-Gon slipped into the galley after Lena and Obi-Wan. The entrance had been too easy. The cooking quarters were vast, with rows of gleaming countertops and food storage units. Servants bustled about, busily preparing a large meal. Lena waited until most of the servants had their backs to the door, then pulled up her hood and walked through the quarters. She carried herself with such authority that nobody bothered to ask who she was, or where she was going. Soon after entering a spectacularly long hallway covered in lush, thick carpet, she ducked into a small room and pulled Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon in after her. The room held several hollow screens. This used to be a guard station, Lena explained. But when her husband died, Zanita didn't think she needed as much protection, so it's no longer used. Qui-Gon felt slightly relieved. At least there was an explanation for the easy entrance. Lena adjusted one of the hollow screens until it showed a large dining room filled with people. It's Bard's birthday, Lena said with relief. A large Fragan birth celebration banner lay across the dining table. I should have remembered. The crowd milled about the room, smiling and carrying glasses filled with red liquid. At first glance it looked like any other party. Qui-Gon looked harder. There's Sunita, Lena said, pointing to a tall older woman, dressed in a black gown covered in tiny smokets. A large scarf was wrapped attractively around her head like a turban. In spite of her age she was easily the most striking person in the room. Qui-Gon was surprised by her commanding presence, and the way she set people around her at ease. Laughing, smiling, and making sure they were taken care of. Then, something else caught his eye. Is that Solon? he asked quietly, 
pointing at a scowling man in the corner. Yes, how did you know, Lena asked. Qui-Gon raised his eyebrows but said nothing. His eyes stayed trained on Solon. Like Zanita, the frowning man was surrounded by a large group of people. But none of the people near Solon seemed to be enjoying his company. They simply stood nervously by. Suddenly Solon stood. A woman next to him rushed to take his empty cup and napkin. Someone else asked if they could get anything for him, but he brushed them off with a wave of his hand. Solon approached the guest of honor, a man shorter than him but who otherwise bore a striking resemblance to him. It was the middle brother, Bard. Casually tossing an arm over Bard's shoulder, Solon interrupted the conversation and steered him toward the outer edges of the party. He spoke in hushed tones. They're all afraid of him, Obi-Wan remarked. Qui-Gon was glad to see the stiffening shoulders of the younger brother had not escaped the attention of his apprentice. Exactly, said Qui-Gon. Even his family is fearful. Lena held up a hand to silence the Jedi. Zanita's leaving the party, she whispered. This is my chance. Without another word, Lena slipped out the door, leaving the Jedi to watch her on the hollow screen. She made her way down the long hallway toward the library. It was a large room, with towering shelves of important-looking books and polished furniture. Zanita was inside, apparently taking a moment to relax. Qui-Gon felt a strange unease. In spite of Zanita's pleasing manner he did not think the meeting would go well. Obi-Wan leaned close to the screen. Lena entered the library unseen by the other guests. The look on Zanita's face when she saw her daughter-in-law was one of sheer pleasure. The older woman stood and embraced Lena, holding her close for a long time. Obi-Wan fiddled with the projection controls beneath the screen, tuning out the party guests until all they heard were the voices of Lena and Zanita in the library. But, my dear, why would you hide from your family, Zanita asked, her voice filled with concern. I was afraid, Lena explained. And without routine, I didn't know what you would think of me. You will always be a cobral, Zanita said solemnly, looking thoughtfully at her daughter-in-law. But why were you afraid? Lena hesitated, then lowered her voice. I am afraid because I think Solon had Rutin killed. Zanita staggered back before sinking onto a large, comfortable-looking sofa. Her skin paled and she reached a shaking hand toward Lena. It was my greatest fear, Zanita whispered as tears sprang to her eyes. I did not want it to be true. And yet, when I look into my heart, I know you are not lying. She pulled a piece of embroidered cloth from her pocket and wiped her eyes before going on. I tried to stop Solon, to make him see reason, but it was too late, she sobbed again. And now Ru Tin is gone. Kneeling beside her, Lena comforted Zanita as best she could. She also told Zanita all she knew of Ru Tin's plan to end the crime ring. I know it will not be easy for you to hear, but now I am planning to testify against the family. Ru Tin's dearest wish has become mine as well. I want to stop the violence, Lena explained, looking into her mother-in-law's eyes. And I need your help. In the guard room, Qui-Gon detected a slight quaver in Lena's voice. He could not fault her, of course. She was asking Zanita to join her in betraying her own family, her own children. Zanita kept her eyes on her lap, but let go of Lena's hand. Her commanding presence seemed somehow diminished, as she sat unmoving on the sofa. At last, she looked up at the portrait hanging on the library wall. It was a picture of three men, the Cobral brothers. Rutin stood proudly, in the center. Yes, she breathed. It must stop. Chapter 5 Zanita sat quietly, for another long moment. When she looked up, there were tears in her eyes. There is a set of documents, she said slowly. I think I can get them for you. But you must promise me, that you will not link my name to the testimony in any way. Of course not, Zanita, Lena assured her. She squeezed her mother-in-law's shoulder. 
I know the violence and corruption are not your doing. Zanita seemed to become empowered, while her mind worked. It reminded Qui-Gon of Lena. It will take me some time to get the documents. Perhaps by tomorrow night, she said. I must be very, very careful. If Solon were to suspect. Suddenly, a loud voice boomed just outside the library door. Qui-Gon's face registered concern. It was a man's voice, and it sounded angry. Lena let go of her mother-in-law's arm, and put a finger to her lips. Without wasting a second she got to her feet and ducked behind a heavy curtain covering the library's transparent steel portal. A moment later the door slid open and Solon thundered into the room. Mother, he said sternly, looking at her as if she were a child who needed scolding. What are you doing in here? Zanita looked evenly at her son. She was not a child, and it appeared that she did not appreciate being treated like one. I was just having a moment to myself, she replied simply. Her face showed no sign of fear. Solon tapped his foot on the floor impatiently. You are the hostess of your son's birthday celebration, he stated. It is not appropriate for you to slip away to have a moment to yourself. If necessary, you can do that when the party is over. Stop bullying me, Solon. This is my house, and I'll do as I like. She looked her son in the face. Solon blinked and stepped backward. Juno needs you in the kitchen, he said more quietly. He is not clear about which service platters you would like to use for dinner. Fine. I will go and discuss it with him, Zanita replied. Good. Then come back to the party. Zanita did not acknowledge the fact that her son had just given her an order. Instead she followed him easily out of the library. She did not turn around as the door quietly closed behind her. After waiting a few moments, Lena left the room as well. Minutes later she met up with the Jedi in the guard station. I assume you heard all of that, she said. He infuriates me, talking to his own mother like that. Sometimes I wish she'd really put him in his place. Her voice quieted. But I suppose that might get her killed. Lena paused while her quick mind moved on to the next thought. Her eyes were suddenly lit with excitement. Qui-Gon wasn't sure if it was the thrill of escape or the result of the meeting with her mother-in-law. Isn't it great, she asked, perhaps a little too brightly. Zanita is going to help us. I knew she would. Leave it to a woman to understand that the violent ways of the crime world can only lead to destruction and hate. Qui-Gon could not help but think of Jenna Zonarbor, a mad female scientist who had conducted horrible experiments on live human subjects, including, him. He knew many women who lived lives of crime and violence. But he didn't say anything. Anyway, I'm very relieved. The meeting couldn't have gone better. It does look as though your mother-in-law is willing to help you get testimony, Qui-Gon agreed. Let's just hope she keeps her word. Lena nodded as she turned back to the security screens. We still have to get out of here without being discovered, she said. She looked at each screen in turn, noting the whereabouts of everyone in the house. Qui-Gon knew she was trying to figure out the best time to leave. Follow me, Lena said after a moment. She slid open the guard station door and peered into the hallway. She motioned to the Jedi, and they all stepped out of the room. Zanita was still in the cooking quarters with Juno, so they left through another, rarely used entrance at the side of the mansion. As they made their way outside, Qui-Gon considered the Cobral family. On the surface, they appeared like any other family. Close and loving, but not without tension. Beneath the surface however, lay dark ties. There was fear there, and possibly hatred as well. Of course, this did not entirely surprise Qui-Gon. A family that ruled a planet with corruption and violence, was bound to have a sinister web woven within it. Distracted by his own thoughts, Qui-Gon did not sense any nearby danger. It was Obi-Wan who cried out first. Look out, he shouted, pushing Qui-Gon and Lena away from their landspeeder. As the three of them tumbled to the ground, 
a huge metal statue thundered down where they had been standing. It crashed into the front end of their landspeeder, missing them, by mere centimeters. Their vehicle was destroyed. And if not for a few seconds of warning, they might have been killed too. Chapter 6 The Jedi and Lena were still on the ground, when Zanita and Juno came rushing out the cooking quarter's door. Qui-Gon felt Lena tense at the sight of the servant, and for a brief moment, Juno glared at her. But his face shifted quickly into a look of concern. Are you all right? he asked, holding out a hand to help her up. Lena got to her feet on her own, and brushed herself off. Fine, she replied briskly. She casually scanned the area to see if anyone else was coming. It was a good thing they had parked their vehicle on the opposite side of the mansion from the entertaining quarters. Qui-Gon was impressed with Lena's composure. And he didn't need to glance at his padawan to know that Obi-Wan was, as well. Zanita's turban was crooked, and the older woman seemed slightly out of breath. But she did not show any surprise, at the fact that Lena had come to her home with two companions she had never met. We really must strengthen the base of that statue, Juno said, eyeing the giant metal sculpture on the ground. It's quite unsafe. Quite, Qui-Gon agreed dryly. Zanita, do you remember Obi-Wan Kenobi and Qui-Gon Jinn? Lena asked, raising her eyebrows slightly at her mother-in-law. They are friends of mine. Qui-Gon knew instinctively that Lena was trying to lead her late husband's mother away from saying out loud, or even somehow suggesting, that she had never met them before. He guessed that this was because of Juno's presence. Of course, Zanita replied easily. How nice to see you again. Qui-Gon smiled with a graciousness he didn't feel. And you as well, he said, taking her hand for a moment in the Fragan custom. Juno appeared annoyed that he hadn't been introduced to the Jedi. Clearing his throat loudly, he stepped toward the group. You must come inside and rest, he declared. We have a medical droid who can examine you for injuries. Qui-Gon tried not to grimace, as he realized that a family like the Cobrals probably needed its own medical droid. But there was something odd about Juno's offer. Qui-Gon was quite sure that, in spite of the look of concern he wore, the servant was not truly worried about their welfare. Perhaps he had other motives for wanting to get the group back inside the house. I'm sure that won't be necessary, Juno, Zanita said pointedly. Lena and her friends were just leaving. She looked around furtively. After the exchange with her son in the library, Qui-Gon guessed that the mention of going inside, or the possibility of someone coming out, made her nervous. You can borrow a land speeder, Lena, she added. It's the least I can do. Lena smiled at her mother-in-law. That would be most appreciated, she said. Thank you, Zanita. Juno scowled at Lena, then started off toward the vehicle storage building. Lena knows where the land speeders are housed, Juno, Zanita said. And she can take either of mine. You don't need to direct her. Juno's frown deepened, but he didn't say anything. We'd best be getting back inside, Zanita said brightly when Juno didn't move. We have guests to attend to. With a last look at the three visitors, Juno turned and followed his employer back into the cooking quarters. Another close one, Lena whispered, shivering slightly. Rutin never liked Juno, and he gives me the creeps. She eyed the door Juno and Zanita had just disappeared through, then turned and started toward the vehicle hangar. Let's get out of here before something else happens. Minutes later Lena and the Jedi were on their way back into the city. It was nice of Zanita to offer up her land speeder, Obi-Wan noted from the front seat. Very nice, Lena agreed. But she did not say anything else. She suddenly seemed to focus very hard on piloting the speeder. Once again in the back seat, Qui-Gon considered the events of the last few hours. Though he didn't particularly want to admit it, he felt at a loss. He was not able to decipher whether Zanita or Lena were being honest. Either with each other, or himself and Obi-Wan. Qui-Gon sighed. 
For the millionth time he wished that Tahal were still alive. Aside from the aching absence that still burned inside him, he knew that her sharp perception and intuition would uncover the truth. She would not be distracted by the composed, polished surfaces of these women. She would cut through all of that and get to their real intentions, their motives. Qui-Gon bowed his head, and tried to let the grief of missing Tahal, move through him. Isn't that what Yoda had taught him, what he had repeatedly told his Padawan? Allow yourself to feel the emotions, then, let them go. Qui-Gon focused on the words. He felt the grief well up inside him, until he was sure it would break him, shatter him to pieces. Then, with every nerve of his body, he tried to let the pain, go. It wouldn't. His head aching, Qui-Gon opened his eyes. It was always the same. He felt the incredible fullness of the pain, and then, endless hollowness. The grief, never actually left. It emptied him, but it would not leave him alone. Chapter 7 Obi-Wan was silent, as the landspeeder traveled through the city. He could sense his master's melancholy mood, and Lena was attentive only to driving. She navigated skillfully through the city, and Obi-Wan was yet again impressed by her composure. Less than half an hour ago, they had nearly been killed. Yet she seemed to have wiped the memory away, as easily as one wipes a crumb from a table. Obi-Wan had assumed that they were going back to Lena's warehouse hideout. Instead, she turned off toward her ransacked apartment after making sure they were not being followed. Obi-Wan considered inquiring about this, but thought better of it. He guessed that Lena was being silent for a reason. Lena parked the landspeeder several hundred meters away from her building. They approached carefully, and found only one guard outside the turbolift. He was dozing off. Moving quickly past him, they entered the turbolift and were whisked to the top floor. Once inside her flat, Lena moved through room after room at a rapid pace, the Jedi at her heels. Qui-Gon did not say anything, but followed with assurance. Obi-Wan felt a moment of frustration as he realized that his master was not experiencing the same confusion he was. Even in his depressed state he seemed to know exactly what was going on. It took a bit of effort for Obi-Wan to keep up with the two people in front of him. Lena led them out the secret exit they had used before, then down flight after flight of stairs. She did not slow her pace when they reached the alley. She simply hurried down several blocks, turning this way and that. Finally she hailed an air taxi and they all climbed inside. Relieved not to be chasing after Lena and his master, Obi-Wan sat back against the seat. Were we being followed, he asked. It was the logical reason for Lena's actions. Not that I know of, Lena said in a strange tone. She sounded almost giddy, as if the idea were amusing. Zanita is really a wonderful woman. I'm lucky to know her. Obi-Wan thought it was strange that Lena was speaking about her mother-in-law as if they were acquaintances, and not family. But once again he kept quiet. What did he know about families anyway? Lena told the taxi driver to let them off several blocks from the warehouse. Once they were walking again, she relaxed a little. A moment later she reached out and touched Obi-Wan's arm. Sorry about that, she said, looking into his eyes. Obi-Wan tried to ignore the way he felt when she gazed at him. I couldn't talk in the taxi because of the Sky Drivers Collective, she explained. They are Cobral supporters. And as for Zanita's vehicle, well, let's just say that it has plenty of added surveillance equipment that even Zanita might not know about. Obi-Wan nodded, and Lena turned and kept walking. She spoke quietly, but loud enough for both Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon to hear. That statue falling was no accident. I'm sure the base is completely secure, no matter what Juno says. There are several traps on the property, the Cobrals call it security. They say they have to protect what's theirs. Who do you think triggered it, Qui-Gon asked, speaking for the first time since they'd left the Cobral property. I don't know, Lena replied. The Cobrals have many allies, paid and unpaid. 
Although Juno is Zenita's servant, he works for Solon first. I'm sure he would be handsomely rewarded if he succeeded in killing me. The group's mood was contemplative, as they navigated the streets and arrived back at the warehouse. Inside, Micah was pacing the living space. A medium-sized package lay on a low table. This arrived while you were out, Micah said. She picked up the package and thrust it into her cousin's hands. She seemed slightly agitated. Lena took the package and turned it over. It was covered in a thin gray wrapping material. There was nothing written on the material other than her name in block letters. Lena, Cobral. Chapter 8 Routine, Lena said, gazing down at the package. She ran her fingers over her name. This is Routin's handwriting, she explained, looking up at the Jedi. I'd recognize it anywhere. Qui-Gon looked down at the package, feeling quite certain that it was some sort of trap. Routin was dead, was he not? I'd like to have a look at that, he said, stepping forward. I want to make sure it is not dangerous before you open it. Lena frowned. Routin would never put me in danger, she said adamantly. Qui-Gon raised an eyebrow. From what he could gather, Routin had put her in significant danger. But he saw no point in reminding Lena of that now. It could be a trap, Qui-Gon said plainly. Lena scowled slightly at Qui-Gon. Perhaps, Qui-Gon mused, she felt he was stealing her last gift from Routin but she gave Qui-Gon the package. Closing his eyes, Qui-Gon held the package for several moments. When he opened them again, he returned the package to Lena. I do not sense anything immediately grave, he said. But he was not convinced that the package was from Routin, or that it would help them gain evidence against the Cobra. He was not convinced of anything. Lena set the box on the table and opened it with a small pocket blade before removing the wrapping. Then she began to empty its contents and set them on the table, a pair of black boots, a small vial of dirt. Lena's face fell as she looked over the contents of the box. This doesn't make sense, she murmured. I think I'll go make us all something to eat, Micah said, excusing herself. Good idea, Micah, Lena said. I'm starved. Qui-Gon sat down next to Lena as soon as Micah left the room. He was unclear about the motives of both women, but felt he might be able to get some answers if he addressed them individually. Have you had any visitors to the warehouse, he asked, not wasting any time. Lena turned her attention away from the package and shook her head. No, why? Instead of answering, Qui-Gon asked another question. Have you received mysterious packages before today? Lena shook her head again. No, of course not. I would have told you about them. I'm glad to hear that, Qui-Gon said, not entirely sure that he believed her. The next question was perhaps the most important. Is Micah the only one who knows about this place, he asked quietly. Lena looked up quickly. She was frowning. I think I'll go see if Micah needs any help with the food, Obi-Wan said abruptly. Qui-Gon gave a brief nod to his Padawan, indicating that he thought it was a good idea. But he did not take his eyes off Lena's face. Still frowning, Lena got to her feet. Yes, Micah is the only other person besides Yoon Obi-Wan who knows about this apartment, she said flatly. She turned to face Qui-Gon again, her hands on her hips. But do not question my cousin's loyalty. Micah and I grew up together. We are like sisters. And she is not in league with the Cobrals. Lena crossed the room, then let out a sigh and came back to sit next to Qui-Gon. I don't even like to discuss the Cobrals in front of Micah, she said slowly. As a very young girl she witnessed the murder of her mother, and the memory is still excruciatingly painful. The Cobrals were responsible for her mother's death, Qui-Gon asked, slightly surprised. Lena nodded sadly. They killed her in cold blood. Micah was only seven and she saw the whole thing. It was a huge loss, and perhaps an even bigger trauma. 
she has never gotten over it. Qui-Gon was silent as this information sank in. Everything on Frego is so complicated, Lena said with a heavy sigh. But I will try to explain. As I've said before, the Cobrals have many allies on Frego. For centuries, Frego's government treated the citizens poorly. Taxes were high, and public services virtually non-existent. Fragans worked hard only to have their money taken from them. The Cobral family changed all of that. While it is true that they made their fortune selling drugs and weapons and had a rough reputation, they used their power to force the government to provide the basic services people needed. They even lowered taxes and raised wages. Which made life for the people better, Qui-Gon said. He had visited planets with similar stories. A corrupt power ousted an unjust government, making positive changes. But the means through which those positive changes were made had its own kind of evil. Today the government acknowledges that the ways of the past were wrong, that they treated the people unfairly, Lena continued. And many politicians resent having to operate under the Cobral thumb. They want to do right by their people. Or at least some of them do. Others appear to be noble, but are corrupt to the core. I see that the Cobral makes things quite complicated, Qui-Gon commented. For everyone, it seems. There is no honesty, no safety, Lena stated. We live by whims and not laws. That is why the violence has to stop. I know there is a better way, and I want Frego to have a chance for a new beginning. The beginning that Rutin and I did not have. Tears welled in Lena's eyes, and for the first time Qui-Gon softened toward her. He understood just how she felt. He and Tahal had never had a new beginning either. Lena wiped her cheek. There are some politicians who would also like to forge a new path for the future. And some people would like to support a new government. But many others feel a strong debt to the Cobrals for making life better. Lena gazed solemnly at the package and the boots on the table. It seems that no one can break free. But you trust your cousin completely? Qui-Gon asked, getting back to his original line of questioning. Lena looked Qui-Gon in the eye. Without hesitation. As I told you, she is like my sister. Micah longs to avenge her mother and shed the corruption. Perhaps, more than anyone. Qui-Gon did not point out that Rutin and Solon were brothers. Instead, he took a breath and let it out slowly. I'm afraid that Micah may have revealed your whereabouts, he stated. Or else, another party has discovered them on their own. Chapter 9 Obi-Wan entered the food galley and was only half surprised to see that the room was empty. Turning back down the hall, he spotted an old turbo lift in one of the makeshift bedrooms. A second later, he felt the building shudder. Micah was running away. Obi-Wan leaped into the turbo lift shaft, landing gracefully on top of the lift, just as it came to a halt. Activating his lightsaber, he sliced a hole in the metal and jumped down a second time. But the lift was already empty. He heard the echo of Micah's receding footsteps as she raced toward the door. Obi-Wan knew he should continue to follow her. Doing so could provide information vital to the mission, and to Lena. What if Micah was out to hurt her cousin? What if her actions put Lena in even greater danger? He couldn't risk that. He had to talk to Micah. Now. It did not take Obi-Wan long to catch up to the girl. Grabbing her arm, he was struck by the anger he felt well up inside him. He was furious, he realized, because Micah was jeopardizing Lena's safety. Obi-Wan calmed himself, intending to let the anger leave him before speaking. But as soon as he saw Micah's face the anger disappeared. The girl was clearly distraught. Where are you going, Obi-Wan asked, trying not to sound too stern. Micah looked alarmed. I. I was. She blinked, her eyes glistening with tears. I need to go somewhere, she finished in a whisper. Not before you tell me what's going on, Obi-Wan said. 
he spotted several large crates in a corner and led her over to them. Sitting her down on one, he found another for himself. It's time for you to tell the truth. If you truly care about Lena, you'll do so, he said. Micah looked down at her feet. She didn't say anything for several minutes. Then she started to talk. The cobrawl is terrible, she began. They do hideous, evil things. But I do not think that Lena, or anyone else, is capable of bringing them down. Rutin tried, and he is dead. Killed by his own family. My mother was killed by the cobrawl as well. A sob escaped Micah's throat and she wiped her eyes. Of course I want to avenge her death. And I know that she is not the only one. Mine is not the only loss. I long to see those killers pay for their crimes. But if I go after them, I would probably be killed too. And so would Lena. They think nothing of taking life. It means nothing to them. Not even in their own family. Obi-Wan nodded. I cannot tell you that you are wrong, he said. But the Cobral has Frego caught in an evil trap of violence and crime. Lena has a chance to destroy that trap, and those who made it, for good. She is willing to take that chance. Micah nodded. I know. Lena is a hero. She thinks nothing of her own life, only of Frego and its people. And I am nothing but a coward, guilty of thwarting her plan. Obi-Wan nodded again, surprised that he was not filled with anger for a second time. He knew that Micah had been deceiving Lena but he was somehow relieved that Micah felt guilty about her actions. How, he asked simply. I wanted to stop the trial, Micah explained. It was too dangerous. So I convinced Lena to wait until you arrived before proceeding with her plan. Then I broke into her apartment and erased the files. I figured that if the evidence was gone, Lena would have to give up. And if she gave up, the Cobral would leave her alone. She would be safe. Of course, I did not expect to find the hired thugs at her apartment. Thugs, Obi-Wan repeated. Micah nodded. They were heavily armed and ransacking the place. At the time I thought they were just street people, thieves after the jewelry and precious metals. Lena and Rutin had a lot of beautiful possessions. She paused for a moment before going on. But then I realized that they must have been searching for something. Did you see what they looked like, Obi-Wan asked. No, Micah said. They fled as soon as they heard me coming. They left the bedroom alone. I only caught a glimpse of their backs as they climbed over the balcony. I did not try to get a better look because I didn't want them to see me. I only know that there were two of them, both men. One, was quite tall and lanky. The other, short and bald. Not much to go on, Obi-Wan mused. I'm sure they were hired by the Cobral, Micah said. Obi-Wan felt better about Micah, now that she had confided in him. But there was still one question that was bothering him. I understand why you wanted to erase the computer files, but why did you leave that threatening message on the screen? Micah looked up, surprised. What message? she asked. I didn't send any message. She paused for a moment. Then, as if reading Obi-Wan's mind, she said, and I didn't tell anyone where Lena was hiding, either. End of chapter Editor's Note In the event that this book has been posted at another location, please note that this audiobook was created by YouTube channel, YJK Audiobooks. Please visit our YouTube channel for other exciting stories. Also, if you are enjoying this audiobook, please consider supporting the expense of our projects through our Patreon page. Those who do so have access to exclusive book series, are able to download the MP3 files for all books we create, and also have early access to our normal YouTube releases. For more details please visit, patreon.com, slash, yjk, audiobooks. The link is also available in the video description below. Thank you for listening, and now, back to the story. 
Chapter 10 Lina looked at Qui-Gon, in disbelief. Qui-Gon could tell she did not think Micah would reveal her whereabouts, but the package on the table meant it was likely that someone, had. The strange contents were not dangerous, but the knowledge of Lina's whereabouts was, especially in the wrong hands. I must speak to Obi-Wan. Qui-Gon excused himself. Walking slowly toward the kitchen, Qui-Gon felt exhausted. This routine mission was turning out to be more difficult than he'd imagined. He felt a strong sense of deception, but something about it continued to elude him. He could not tell who was being deceived, or by whom. And he did not understand why Lena so fiercely protected her cousin. She had obviously learned, the hard way, that family lines do not protect you from being double-crossed, or killed. The food galley was empty. Following his instincts, Qui-Gon started down the stairs. Halfway to the ground level, Qui-Gon met Obi-Wan and a sullen Micah coming up the stairwell. The evidence is gone, Obi-Wan blurted. Micah erased it. Erased, or stole, Qui-Gon asked, looking directly at Micah. Erased, Micah spat back defiantly. I do not profit by the misfortune of others, especially Lena. Her voice softened when she spoke of her cousin. I only wanted to protect her. To make all of this go away. Micah hung her head and shuffled her feet before the Jedi led her back up the stairs. She obviously knew it was time to tell Lena, what she had done. Although she was clearly ashamed of her actions, Qui-Gon felt that her conscience was clear. She was not deceiving them. He felt relief in knowing that somebody wasn't. Obi-Wan. Qui-Gon stopped his Padawan on the landing, allowing Micah to go farther ahead. We must proceed with caution. All is not as it seems with our witness. On this planet, lies come easier than the truth, and at a lower cost. As Obi-Wan raised his eyes to meet his masters, Qui-Gon saw tiny flames of anger burn inside them, then flicker out. Lena is a noble woman, Obi-Wan said evenly. She is struggling to do what is right. Your doubts will not help her. Qui-Gon could not help but smile faintly. Obi-Wan thought Qui-Gon was insulting Lena, and he was upset, ready to defend her. It confirmed what Qui-Gon had suspected, that Obi-Wan was infatuated with Lena. He should have pointed it out sooner, to try and warn the boy. Most likely he would end up getting badly hurt. You are infatuated, Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon said. Be careful not to let yourself be guided by your attraction. I am. Obi-Wan shook his head and struggled to keep his voice under control. It is not infatuation. Lena's motives are good. The motives she has told us are good, but there may be others. Think of what she is giving up. She will probably never live again in the manner to which she was accustomed. She lost her footing with the Cobral when Ru Tin was killed and is in danger of being an outcast. Not just from the family, but from all of Frego. Don't you think it is possible that she is trying to get evidence in order to have something to bargain with? Obi-Wan made no gesture to show that he understood. There is another day, he said softly. Then we shall see. He turned to walk up the stairs. Qui-Gon entered Lena's quarters behind his apprentice. Micah stood over the table, staring at an empty box. The contents of the package were gone. I told her I erased the evidence, Micah said tearfully. But I don't think she even heard me. Where is Lena now? Qui-Gon asked. Obi-Wan was already headed for the stairs. I don't know, Micah sobbed, sinking into a low couch. She didn't say anything to me. She just took what was in the box, and left. Chapter 11 Obi-Wan, wait, his master commanded. Obi-Wan did not want to listen. Not now. Not while Lena was alone, and in danger. But he slid to a stop at the top of the stairs. We'll have a better chance of finding her if we have some idea where she might have gone, Qui-Gon said. He sat down, next to Micah. Where do you think she went, he asked evenly. 
Obi-Wan remained at the top of the stairs. He knew his impatience had little to do with finding Lena. He was impatient with his master, and a bit confused. He used to know Qui-Gon so well, that at times it felt like they shared one mind. They both knew how the other would react to a situation, what his thoughts and actions would be. But this was no longer the case. Just when Obi-Wan believed that Qui-Gon was beyond caring about the mission, he had taken charge. If Qui-Gon hadn't stopped Obi-Wan, he would be with Lena now, and sure of her safety. Leaning against the stair railing, Obi-Wan let out an exasperated sigh. There was no point in questioning Micah. Let's go, then, Qui-Gon said. He stood and strode toward the stairs in fluid movement. Micah, eyes still red from crying, hurried in front of him. Obi-Wan followed. He had been too lost in his own thoughts to hear where they were headed. Breathing deeply, he let go of his frustration and focused his energy on the matter at hand. Qui-Gon had no right to doubt Lena. He had been too distracted until now to even notice who she was, her real nature. But if Qui-Gon was, at least for the moment, concentrating on the mission, Obi-Wan could too. Micah was not as concerned with being seen this time as she led the Jedi through the streets of Rian. They left the warehouses and alleys and hurried into the center of the city. Over Qui-Gon's head Obi-Wan saw a gleaming transparent structure, like an enormous serpent that snaked its way overhead, between the towering buildings. Inside the structure Obi-Wan saw green leaves and moving forms. Water beaded on the inside of the rounded transparent steel walls, making it look like a vast, multi-storied greenhouse. Although Obi-Wan could not see where it began or where it ended, the structure appeared to wind through the city for several kilometers. There, an out-of-breath Micah said, pointing toward a door to the structure. I think she might be in the Tubal Park. I was hoping for something a bit smaller, Qui-Gon said. Obi-Wan could not tell if he was mildly amused or truly frustrated. Obi-Wan caught up to Micah as they approached the entrance. Why would she come here, he asked. This park means a lot to Lena. She used to come here with Ru Tin, and she always comes here to think, Micah answered. Or at least she used to. The giant oval doors opened and the three stepped inside. As the doors closed behind them Obi-Wan felt as if he'd stepped off a ship onto another planet. Inside the air was moist. The noise of the city was gone, replaced by the echoing sound of running water and children's voices. Looking up, Obi-Wan could only barely make out the seams in the roof beyond the tops of the towering trees. Paths crisscrossed one another, leading toward brightly blooming plants or meandering beside creeks and trickling waterfalls. People strolled over the bridges and ducked through the tunnels that wove under and around the dense flora. There were small animals winging overhead, and even smaller amphibians flopping in the pools. Obi-Wan could see why Lena would come here. It reminded him of the Room of a Thousand Fountains at the Jedi Temple. That too, was a sanctuary and a great place to go to think. Do you know her favorite spot? Qui-Gon asked. Micah shook her head sadly. I never came here with her. She only came alone, or with Rutin. She could be anywhere. Then I suggest we split up, Qui-Gon said to Obi-Wan. Micah can come with me. Obi-Wan nodded and headed off to his left. It would be a relief to be away from Qui-Gon for a while. He could use some time alone to think. As soon as he had walked away from his master, Obi-Wan's mind filled with thoughts of Lena. All around him people were gathered in small groups. They ate, played, and leaned back on the grass to stare up at the leaves. Yet Obi-Wan was only aware of them enough to know that they were not Lena. Could it really be infatuation? Obi-Wan wondered. After taking several deep breaths and letting go of his anger and frustration, Obi-Wan could not deny it. As usual, Qui-Gon was right. He was falling for Lena. But it was not just her beauty. No, it was more than that. It was her strength, the strength she drew from her vulnerability, that had enamored him. Lena was a grieving young widow. The husband she had loved was only recently lost. 
But instead of hiding in the hole that he'd left, she pulled new purpose from it. She was not drowning in it, refusing to speak of the loss. Not like Qui-Gon. Obi-Wan's thoughts drifted back to his master. He shook his head as he climbed a steep bridge arching over a waterfall. Perhaps the bond between them was not as damaged as Obi-Wan imagined. No matter how he tried, Obi-Wan could not deny that Qui-Gon correctly recognized Obi-Wan's feelings for Lena, and before he did. How can he be so clear about the emotions of others when he cannot seem to untangle his own? Obi-Wan wondered. With time, Master Yoda would say. With time all are healed. Obi-Wan felt new energy flood through him as he relaxed and let go of everything that had been bothering him. He had been in danger of letting his emotions blind him. Now he felt more sure. Still, Obi-Wan did not believe his master had been right about everything. Walking more quickly, and scanning the park for Lena, Obi-Wan realized his resolve to help her was stronger than ever. Whether or not his judgment had been clouded by affection, he knew that Lena was on the side of rightness. For the first time in hours, Obi-Wan felt clear. And he was more certain than ever, that Lena was doing the right thing. She was fighting for peace and justice, and not just for herself. For her entire planet. As a Jedi, it was his duty to help. As these thoughts formed in his mind, a new one floated over them, like a dark cloud. They were running out of time. Chapter 12 Qui-Gon pulled his comlink from his utility belt. He was about to activate it and summon Obi-Wan, when his Padawan appeared, walking toward him on one of the paths. There he is, said Micah, a moment later. She craned her neck to see what Qui-Gon already knew. Lena wasn't with him, either. The three of them had scoured most of the enormous park, but Lena was nowhere to be found. Micah and the Jedi left the park, and walked back to the deserted warehouse in silence. Qui-Gon tried to stretch out with his feelings, to get a sense of whether or not Lena was in danger, or even alive. But he felt nothing. The dim evening light made the hideout look less welcoming than it had, early that morning. Qui-Gon strode into the room ahead of the others, and immediately saw a figure sitting on the couch in the darkness. In a flash, he activated his lightsaber. Its green blade cast an eerie light over the room, illuminating the sparks in Lena's eyes. Qui-Gon quickly switched off the blade just as Obi-Wan and Micah came into the room. Lena, Micah cried when she saw her cousin. She hurried forward and sank to her knees in front of the couch. Lena, we were so worried. Where were you? I'm sorry I ran off, Lena said, looking from one person to the next. I didn't want to worry you, but I had to be sure that the package was from Rutin. I had to know. Lena trailed off. Micah rose to turn on the light. Back on the table, next to the wrappings, were the contents of the package, the pair of waterproof boots, the small light, the beam drill, and the vial of dirt. The objects made no sense to Qui-Gon. What did Lena have to know? And where had she been? Qui-Gon felt betrayed. She was not telling them the whole truth. Although Lena appeared to be upset, Qui-Gon did not wait for her to calm down. Where have you been, he demanded. Lena looked up, surprised by the stern tone of the Jedi's voice. Wandering, she replied. I, I needed to be alone. Qui-Gon was not satisfied. Alone? Or just away from us? Lena's lip trembled and Qui-Gon noticed Obi-Wan was staring at him. He softened his tone slightly, but pressed on. Why did you take the contents of the package with you? That package is from Rutin, Lena said after a moment, struggling to control her voice. He sent it to me, before he. She fought again for composure. But how did he know he was going to die? And why didn't he tell me? Lena lost the struggle to suppress her frustrated grief and dropped her head into her hands. He's trying to give me a message, she said after a moment, struggling to control her voice. But I can't figure it out. It's as though he's speaking to me, 
and I can't hear him. Lena lost the struggle. He really is gone forever. Micah and Obi-Wan rushed to join her on the couch, anxious to offer support. Qui-Gon stumbled back until he was sitting, facing the other three. Lena looked so much smaller than she had before. Less capable of deception, somehow. Qui-Gon felt himself diminish as Lena's waves of grief washed into him, adding to the sea of sadness that never stopped pounding in his heart. Her words touched him deeply, and he had no more doubts about her sincerity. He too, knew how the fact of a loved one's absence could strike with as savage a blow as the first realization. He knew that moment when the future ahead seemed empty and impossible to bear. The loved ones we have lost are always with us, Qui-Gon said. He was surprised to hear himself speaking, and surprised by his words. But they rendered comfort. Suddenly, it did feel as if Tahal were nearby, and the storm inside of him quieted a little. There was a moment of thoughtful silence in the room. Obi-Wan gazed at his master, his eyes full of compassion. And for the first time Qui-Gon did not feel the need to look away. Lena's grief seemed to lift, and she looked at the Jedi Master gratefully. It's true, she said, nodding. Ru Tin is looking after me even now. He must have sent this package some time ago and arranged to have it delivered today. I'm sure it is meant to help me find evidence. He must have known that any information on the computer would be a target. He knew I would need something more. Qui-Gon noticed that Micah paled as Lena spoke of the computer. He wondered if she was embarrassed that her plan hadn't worked, or frightened by the possibility that more evidence existed. The young widow took no notice of her cousin. Her tears had stopped and the familiar strength was returning. Lena gathered the boots from the table and held them in her lap. I haven't figured out the clue yet, but I will, she said firmly. Just please don't rush off like that again, Micah told her. You scared me to death. We searched the park for hours. Lena frowned. The park, she murmured. Obi-Wan stared at the strange items on the table, then suddenly spoke. Rutin had the package delivered to you, here. So, he must have known about the hideout. Of course, Lena said. Rutin was the one who secured this place. He was planning to hide here himself, while he waited to be smuggled off the planet. Suddenly, Lena leaped to her feet, knocking the boots aside. I almost forgot, she cried, pulling a data pad from her pocket. While I was out, I went by my apartment to see if I'd received a message from Zanita. She sent this. Chapter 13 The sky outside the warehouse, had darkened to a milky gray. Qui-Gon peered around the portal screens that masked the people inside, from the streets below. It was getting late, and the alleys were deserted. Meeting with Zanita is an unnecessary risk, Qui-Gon stated, as he left the portal and paced the floor. He suddenly felt that leaving the planet as soon as possible was the best course of action. We have the clues from Rutin, and should work with that. We do not need to place you, or your mother-in-law, in further danger. She's taking a risk because I asked her to, Lena argued. I can't just let her wait in vain. With a frown, Qui-Gon looked at the message on the data pad again. Transport loading station, dock 12. 10 p.m. tonight. Alone. For routine. I never should have gotten Zanita involved, Lena lamented. But it is too late to change that now. If I can go alone, I can talk to her and convince her that I've changed my mind. I'll tell her I'm scared and have decided to leave the planet. Then we will all be safer. Qui-Gon had to admit that it was not a bad plan. It would buy them some time and could even help them get off planet easier. He nodded his assent. But we won't let you go alone, Obi-Wan said. Micah looked relieved to hear this. Of course not, Qui-Gon echoed. It is not safe. It is the only way I can convince Sunita, Lena argued. She saw you at the estate. Surely she knows you are here representing the Galactic Republic. 
I will not be able to convince her I've changed my mind if she sees I am accompanied by Jedi. We are here for your protection, Qui-Gon said firmly. And to make sure you are what you say you are. Learning that Lena had returned to her apartment when she was alone had once again aroused Qui-Gon's suspicions. She could have done any number of things while she was there. Though he accepted the sincerity of her grief, he would not lose sight of the fact that there could be pressures on her that he knew nothing about. I'm afraid you're stuck with us until we all arrive safely back on Coruscant. Obi-Wan smiled. We will remain hidden, but we will not allow you to go alone. Lena returned Obi-Wan's smile. All right, she said. We'd better hurry so we are first to arrive. It's not very far. Be careful, Micah said, embracing her cousin. I'll be here if you need me. I'll always be here if you need me. Lena touched her cousin's cheek. I'll be right back, she promised. Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, and Lena left the warehouse and made their way through the dark streets, lit only by the occasional light of the planet's two moons. Now that daylight had faded, Frago seemed a less inviting place. It was as though the darkness brought out the lies and deceit that pervaded the planet. As the three neared the station, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan fell back into the shadows. Lena insisted on walking boldly in the middle of the street, under the glowing lights. She should be more careful, Obi-Wan muttered. No, Padawan, Qui-Gon said. She should not appear as if she has anything to hide. Besides, her presence will help to diminish ours. Dock 12 was eerily silent. Low buildings rimmed a giant landing pad where huge transport ships were loaded with goods. The edges of the pad were almost completely dark. Obi-Wan motioned to his master and both Jedi leaped noiselessly onto a low rooftop. After making his way to the edge, Qui-Gon lay down next to Obi-Wan and the two watched Lena walk slowly into the orange square of light in the center of the landing pad. From their perch the Jedi could see everything, and they could be at Lena's side in a moment. Although Lena's was the only shape Qui-Gon could make out in the darkness, he sensed they were not alone. He had felt another presence almost from the moment they had left the hideout, but now the feeling was stronger, more threatening. From the opposite side of the pad, Zanita stepped into view. Lena moved with both arms out to greet her mother-in-law. But Zanita did not raise her arms, or offer any greeting. After taking one more lurching step forward, the reason became clear. Zanita's mouth was covered with a gag, and behind her, holding her bound arms firmly pressed against her back, was her oldest son, Solon Kobrol. Chapter 14 Obi-Wan leaped to his feet, as three more figures emerged behind Solon and Zanita. But Qui-Gon pulled him back down. Obi-Wan wrestled his arm free of his master. He had to protect Lena. She was unarmed, facing two droids, Solon Kobrol, and his brother, Bard. The young widow was no match for men evil enough to hold their own mother captive, or order the death of their own brother. Not yet, Qui-Gon said softly. I'd like to see what these men have in mind. Obi-Wan sank to his knees. He would wait, for now. But if anyone made a move toward Lena, not even Qui-Gon would be able to stop him. In the orange light of the landing pad Lena took a few steps back. Solon, she said. Her voice sounded strange to Obi-Wan, almost full of guilt. He wondered if she felt responsible for what was happening to Zanita. You were supposed to come alone, the crime boss boomed. I did, Lena replied without flinching. Nervous that they had been spotted, Obi-Wan felt for his lightsaber. He tried to rise but Qui-Gon's hand on his shoulder pushed him back to his knees. Not us, Qui-Gon whispered. Don't hurt her, a voice cried in the darkness below. She didn't know I was coming. Obi-Wan recognized the voice immediately. It was Micah. A moment later she was standing beside her cousin. Obi-Wan had not known she was there. Please, don't hurt Lena. She would never turn against the Cobra. She's only been trying to cover for me. 
I am the one you want. I am the one who knows how you operate. I am the one who wanted to testify against you. Micah, no. Be quiet, Lena whispered in an attempt to stop her cousin's outburst. Don't listen to her, Lena told the Cobrals. She is protecting me. She doesn't know that I came tonight to tell Zanita I've changed my mind. I was a fool to think I could go against the Cobral. Solon, please hear me. You and Bard and Zanita, are all I have left of my precious husband, Rutin. I realize that I need to hold on to the family I have, now more than ever. Where will I be, if I drive you away? No matter what has happened in the past, we will always be family. And family, is more important to me than anything. How wise, Solon replied, chuckling. He shoved Zanita toward Bard, who caught her with one hand. He held a blaster in the other. I'm touched that you still want to be a part of the family, he continued, taking a step closer. And I'm grateful that you came together, he continued, walking closer still. It will make cleaning up the mess you've made that much easier. Solon dove toward Lena and Micah, as the two droids closed in on either side. Up on the roof, Obi-Wan knew it was time. Qui-Gon was at his side as he leaped off the roof and sprinted toward the helpless cousins. Micah was caught in Solon's grasp, but Lena pulled away just in time. She turned to run, and found herself face to face with a lanky, but potentially lethal, droid. The one-eyed droid's arms shot out from its sides, and began to wrap themselves around her. Lena ducked at the same moment Obi-Wan's lightsaber blade severed one arm, and with a mighty backswing, separated the droid's head from its body. Obi-Wan pushed Lena behind him and rushed to meet the other droid. Beside him, Qui-Gon deflected a bolt from Bard's blaster, sending it toward Solon's feet. Solon struggled to hold on to Micah and train his blaster on the Jedi. He did not notice Lena sneaking up behind him. Lena grabbed Solon's blaster. Micah whipped her body back and forth, delivering a sharp blow with her elbow to Solon's jaw. He lost his grip on both Micah and the weapon. The second droid fired rapid bolts at Obi-Wan, who deflected them easily. Though the bolts turned and rained back on the droid, it did not show any damage. It continued to spray the pad with fire while rapidly extending a long arm to grab Micah. Qui-Gon dispatched the arm with an elegant sweep of his lightsaber and stepped forward to finish the job. A slashing blow to the machine's midsection finally brought the droid down. While Qui-Gon took care of the droid, Obi-Wan quickly surveyed the scene. Behind him, Micah appeared to be in shock. She lay on the ground, staring into the darkness. Lena, bravely held her blaster on Solon. Suddenly, Obi-Wan leaped high in the air over Lena's head. He knew what was going to happen, before it happened, but still was not in time to deflect the blast. From his spot, deep in the shadows, still holding the bound and gag Zanita, Bard fired his blaster, straight at Lena. Micah dove. Lena screamed. And the bolt, found flesh. Chapter 15 While Obi-Wan hurried toward the two women, Qui-Gon hit the ground running. He rushed toward Bard and his hostage, but could not see where they had gone in the darkness. He could merely hear the muffled sounds of the footsteps, fleeing ahead of him. Qui-Gon raced behind a building, in time to see Solon climb into a repulsor lift vehicle. Bard shoved his mother in behind his brother, and the engine gunned. Qui-Gon stopped short, his breath catching in his throat. The Cobrals had a vehicle waiting. It was useless to pursue them on foot. Besides, Qui-Gon was anxious to return to the dock. He had a terrible feeling about what he would find there. Qui-Gon rounded the corner of the building. In the orange square of light he saw two figures kneeling. A third figure lay in his Padawan's arms. There was no life emanating from the body. Micah was dead. Lena threw herself onto her cousin's body, sobbing. No, Micah, she cried, begging. Not you. Don't leave me. Qui-Gon stared at the scene before him, frozen. 
His mind flashed back to Tahal's last words to him. A horrible ache clenched his chest. Wherever I am headed, I will wait for you, Qui-Gon, she had said. I've always been a solitary traveler. Not anymore, Qui-Gon had teased. We will go on together. You promised, and you can't back out now. I'll never let you forget it. Tahal had smiled slightly, and the effort drained her. Qui-Gon had known then that she was in grave danger. That she was going to die. He'd called on the Force, on the Jedi, on his great love for her. Nothing had been able to save the woman he loved. Qui-Gon had rested his forehead against Tahal's. Their breath mingled. Let my last moment be this one, she had said. And it was. Master, Obi-Wan said quietly, and Qui-Gon was suddenly brought back to the moment. Lena was crumpled over Micah in front of him, wallowing in her pain. There was no trace of the strong, resolved woman Qui-Gon had met when he arrived on Frago. He did not see the woman who he thought might be deceiving them. He only saw a woman bent over a dead body, unable to cope with her agony. He knew exactly how that felt. But he had survived, had gone on. And he believed that Lena could as well. Qui-Gon bent down next to Lena. I am so sorry, he said softly. I know I cannot share your pain. But I do understand it. With a shudder, Lena let go of Micah's body. I would like to wrap the body, she said, wiping her eyes. It is the custom here. Obi-Wan found an old tarp outside a nearby ship, and Lena showed the Jedi the traditional way to enclose the body in it. Micah always looked out for me, Lena said as she lay the wrapped body gently on the ground. She always tried to guide me in the right direction. The three stood quietly together for a moment, silently saying goodbye. Then they left Micah lying in the pool of orange light. The park, Lena said as they slowly moved away from the body. Micah said you'd searched it for hours. We did, Obi-Wan confirmed. Lena's shoulders straightened and her eyes cleared. I know what Ru Tin was trying to tell me, she said with sudden certainty. We have to get to the park immediately. Qui-Gon was amazed at Lena's ability to change her focus back to finding the necessary evidence. Her face was full of deep sadness, but she carried herself upright as she led them to the Tubal Park. Once inside, Lena headed directly for a spot at the rear of the park. It was still dark, but the sky had completely cleared and the planet's two moons shone in the night sky. Their silver light partly lit the paths, bridges, and brooks. Qui-Gon continuously scanned the area around them. He did not sense anything dangerous. The park seemed serene and peaceful, just as it had during the day. But it would have been foolish to let his guard down. Obi-Wan stood a distance away, alert for any trespass. Suddenly, Lena stopped short next to a small stand of lush tropical trees. A stream gurgled over smooth rocks and into a pool of clear water. With a sigh, Lena sat down. This was our special place, she said. I remember the first time Ru Tin brought me here, four years ago. We were not even married yet. But we had so many plans, so many dreams. Her eyes shone with happiness for a brief moment. But before long, tears were welling in them and she broke down, sobbing. I'm so sorry, she said. Sometimes it is more than I can bear. I find myself wishing that it was I who had been killed, not him. I would have gladly given my life to save his. Qui-Gon nodded. I too, have wished I could have given my life to save another, one whom I had loved. But now I know that it is often harder to be the one left behind. I would not have wanted her to feel such loneliness, to go through the pain I have gone through. He touched Lena's arm briefly. Rutin left these things for you because he knew his death was possible, and he trusted that you would carry on. Qui-Gon looked into Lena's eyes, and knew that his words were getting through to her. Surprisingly, he felt a lightning in his own chest as well. His grief for Tahal was still excruciating, but he suddenly knew that there would come a time, when it would be possible to bear. 
and in his heart, he was certain that Tahal would want him to carry on too. She would have hated the way he had chosen to mourn her, he realized suddenly. He had allowed his grief to remove him, from everyone who had tried to help him. Because the weight of his sorrow was so terrible, he could not lift his head to see that others mourned her too. Obi-Wan. Yoda. Bant. Klee Rava. The list was long. Her face rose in his mind. He could see the ironic twist to her lips. Now who's blind, she said. Her voice was so real to him. How he wished he could answer. Thank you, Qui-Gon, Lena said softly, breaking his reverie. As difficult as it is to live without routine, I know that you are right. Qui-Gon briefly squeezed Lena's hand. He noticed that his Padawan's face wore a look of confused frustration, and felt he had some explaining to do. But now was not the time to discuss it. They had to find the evidence and leave the planet. Do you have any ideas about what the clues from the package mean? Qui-Gon asked. Lena got to her feet and began to look under rocks and thick green leaves. I'm sure this is the spot, she explained. But the clues don't make any sense to me. Why would I need a drill? Or a pair of boots? The three searched the area, finding nothing but grass, water, rocks, and plants. There's nothing here, Obi-Wan finally said, sounding exasperated. It's just like any other lovely spot in the woods. Hearing his words, Lena suddenly looked up. But it isn't, of course, she said. It's all manufactured. Human-made. She began to look at the ground in a new way. She stepped across a patch of fake ground covered with moss. Getting to her knees, she peeled it back. Underneath was a large, locked panel. Lena picked up the beam drill and forced the panel open. Lifting it aside, she found a short tunnel descending down. Excited, Lena lowered herself into the tunnel. A moment later Qui-Gon heard a loud splash. Well, I know what the boots were for, she called up. I'm up to my ankles in water. But at least it's not sewage. Qui-Gon handed Lena the boots. They were big, and Lena pulled them on over her shoes. Then she turned on the flashlight and splashed around. She was inside a small pump room. Do you need help? Obi-Wan called down. There was some more splashing, but no response. Then, Several moments of complete silence. Qui-Gon and his Padawan exchanged glances. Qui-Gon was just about to lower himself into the tunnel, when they heard a gleeful shout. I found it, Lena exclaimed. A moment later, she emerged with a second small package in a waterproof sheathing. Qui-Gon hoped it was the evidence they needed. Chapter 16 the three wasted no time getting back to the warehouse. They had been at the park for a couple of hours, and it was now very early morning. Obi-Wan was anxious to get to the makeshift apartment, and open the package. He was also exhausted, and hoped they would be able to rest for a few hours before planning their next move. But then, his master was never one to rest. There had been many times when Obi-Wan was certain that the older Jedi simply did not need sleep. Once safely inside the warehouse, Lena ripped open the package. Inside was a data pad, well wrapped and protected from water or shaking. Lena switched the tiny machine on and they all waited while it hummed to life. The next few moments seemed to go on for hours. Her hands a bit shaky, Lena put the data pad on a low table and sat down on the sofa. The data pad beeped. Lena pressed a series of buttons on the side of the machine, and information began to flash across the screen. Information about illegal land negotiations, bribery, government extortion, contracts for murders, the list of crimes went on and on. Say goodbye to power, Solon, she whispered. Lena looked up at the Jedi, smiling. This will put the Cobral behind bars for a long, long time, she said. Obi-Wan sighed in relief. Soon this mission would be over. Lena would be safe, and Frego would be free. 
Qui-Gon did not waste any time in contacting Senator Crote on Coruscant. He explained that they had the evidence they needed, and they would be traveling with it first thing in the morning. Wonderful, the senator replied. Take the Daguerrean too. It is fast and available. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. With nothing more to do, Lena and the Jedi settled down for a few hours rest. But while Lena slept in the room next door and his master dozed nearby, Obi-Wan found that, exhausted as he was, sleep evaded him. He kept remembering the conversation he'd overheard between his master and Lena in the park. Qui-Gon had never spoken so frankly about his grief, to anyone. Why did he choose to confide in a woman he barely trusted, and not in his own Padawan? Obi-Wan knew that Tahal's death was incredibly hard for Qui-Gon. He knew now that his master was in love with her. But while Tahal was alive Obi-Wan had not fully recognized that their love existed. When did it blossom? Qui-Gon and Tahal barely had any time together that he knew about. As Obi-Wan lay in the darkness, guilt washed over him. He knew it was not right for him to be upset with his master. Who he chose to confide in was his decision. And if it was not Obi-Wan, so be it. Rolling over, Obi-Wan remembered his master's words to Lena. He remembered the look in Qui-Gon's eyes. And more than anything, he wished he could find a way to ease his master's pain. At last the fatigue of the mission overcame Obi-Wan and he began to drift into sleep. But just as his senses were falling into a more relaxed state, he heard movement in Lena's room. Obi-Wan sat up, wondering for half a moment if Lena was trying to escape without them. If his master had been right to question her motives all along. She'd spoken convincingly to Solon, perhaps she really did want to make amends with the Cobra. Then Obi-Wan heard a second set of footsteps and a struggle. Someone was attacking Lena. Checking to make sure his lightsaber was safely at his side, Obi-Wan broke into Lena's room. Lena sat on a chair, bound and gagged. A figure wearing a hooded burgundy tunic stood over her. Launching himself into the air, Obi-Wan somersaulted over the two of them, pulling back the figure's hood. He expected to find the face of a cobra, but did not recognize the stranger, whose face contorted into a tangle of rage as he drew a blaster. Obi-Wan was ready with his lightsaber, but the intruder quickly shoved something into his pocket and made for the transparisteel portal. He was about to disappear when Qui-Gon burst into the room and knocked the man into the wall with a force wave. The intruder slid to the floor and was still. Obi-Wan quickly untied Lena. Are you all right? he asked. Lena nodded. Another thug working for the Cobra, she said, cracking a half smile. I'm almost getting used to them. Good timing, Master, Obi-Wan said wryly as he helped Lena to her feet. Thank you, Qui-Gon replied as he bent over the man. He's going to wake up with quite a headache, I'm afraid. Qui-Gon had not cracked a joke in weeks, and it was music to Obi-Wan's ears. Qui-Gon searched the man's pockets, and quickly retrieved Rutin's data pad. He retrieved something else, Obi-Wan saw, but concealed it in his hand. Qui-Gon stood up, and faced Lena and Obi-Wan. His face was grave with concern. There's been a change in plans. We must leave Frego as soon as possible, he said. Chapter 17 Lena, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan were silent, as they once again made their way through the darkened streets of Rian. It was almost dawn, and a pale yellow light was beginning to overtake the sky. Qui-Gon was anxious for the mission to be over. But as he strode purposefully ahead, he could not shake the feeling that they were far from the end. When they arrived at one of the city's many landing platforms, Obi-Wan headed straight for the Daguerrean too. He was practically boarding the ship, before Qui-Gon was able to catch up to him. Lena was at his heels. No, Padawan, Qui-Gon said quietly, pulling him aside. We will not be taking this ship. Qui-Gon gestured with his head toward a lone vehicle in the corner of the launch bay. I believe that this one will better serve our purposes. Obi-Wan looked momentarily confused, 
then he nodded. He gently steered Lena away from the Daguerrean too, and guided her to a shadowy area of the platform. Qui-Gon approached the pilot of the smaller ship. We're looking for passage to Coruscant, he explained in a low voice. We'd like to leave as soon as possible. The pilot stopped what he was doing and stood to his full height, which was considerable. He did not say anything at first, but simply looked Qui-Gon in the eye. Qui-Gon returned his gaze without flinching. He felt confident that this man was not in league with the Cobra. Flying with him would be relatively safe. I can fly you to Coruscant, the pilot finally said. He named his fee, which seemed a fair price. Qui-Gon agreed. We have some business to attend to, but we'll return shortly, he said. The pilot nodded. I will be ready. Qui-Gon turned and headed back to Obi-Wan and Lena. Now he only had to make it appear as if they were leaving the planet on the Daguerrean too, as planned. Time to board, he said in a normal voice as he walked up the boarding ramp. Then he quietly added to Obi-Wan, let me do the talking. The Daguerrean too was a large and comfortable ship, with a diplomatic lounge and roomy sleeping quarters for its passengers. The Jedi and Lena were greeted by a droid host as soon as they got on board. Qui-Gon was surprised to see that the droid was identical to those he and Obi-Wan had cut down earlier in the evening, but greeted the droid as if he were expecting him. After chatting for a few brief moments and accepting a message of welcome from Senator Crote, Qui-Gon declared that they were all very tired and would like to retire to their resting quarters. That will be fine, the droid replied. I can show you the way. It led them down a long hall to a trio of spacious rooms. Thank you, Qui-Gon said. Please be sure to wake us before we arrive. The droid nodded. Of course. We have clearance to leave in twenty minutes. He stood for a moment, as if waiting to make sure that each of them went into a room. Lena yawned and said good night, then disappeared through a doorway. Obi-Wan did the same, and Qui-Gon followed. Qui-Gon waited for a good fifteen minutes before knocking on Lena's door. We're getting off early, Qui-Gon said as Obi-Wan appeared behind him. Lena looked confused. Do you think it is safe? she asked. Safer than staying on board, Obi-Wan replied with a grimace. Qui-Gon started down the hall and the others followed closely behind. They escaped through a small hatch at the back of the ship just as the craft's engines hummed to life. They were boarding the other ship by the time the Daguerrean II disappeared into the atmosphere above them. As soon as everyone was safely on board, Qui-Gon explained what had just transpired. I'm afraid Senator Crote is not what he appears to be. He pulled a travel order bearing the official Fragan senatorial seal from his pocket. It also bore Senator Crote's signature. I found this on the thug who tried to steal Rutin's evidence. Lena's eyes widened. The senator, she exclaimed. I felt certain he was above this, that he was not part of the corruption. I have felt certain of many things that have not been so, Qui-Gon replied. There are many hidden truths in a galaxy such as ours. Lena sat back and rubbed her eyes. She was clearly overwhelmed. It seemed there was no end to the Cobral web of lies. Obviously, I did not think it worth the risk to fly on the Daguerrean too, Qui-Gon continued. He flashed a brief smile. I think we've taken enough risks already. The small vessel took off a short while later, and the Jedi and Lena settled in for the journey. Though the ship was not nearly as large or as fancy as the Daguerrean too, Qui-Gon noticed that a sense of calm came over the group as they rose into the air. They were finally leaving Frago behind. When the ship was about halfway to Coruscant, Qui-Gon was startled out of his meditative state, by the buzz of his comlink. A moment later, Yoda's familiar voice began to speak. Been attacked, the Daguerrean too has, he said simply. His statement was followed by a few seconds of silence. Then, survivors, there are not. Chapter 18 Jedi Master Mace Windu, met Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, and Lena, 
at the landing platform. It had been a long journey, and it was afternoon on the city planet of Coruscant. The sun was high in the sky, making reflections on the thousands of on-planet transport vehicles, and glinting off of the towering skyscrapers. You must be Lena Cobral, Master Windu said, taking her hand for a moment. It is good to finally meet you. He looked at each of them in turn, before leading them into the Jedi Temple. We are grateful that you are safe, he said. The news of Senator Crote came as a surprise, and obviously not a pleasant one. Then, when the Daguerrean II was destroyed. Obi-Wan winced, as he remembered how close they had all come to being killed. We would like to get Lena on the stand as soon as possible, he said, changing the subject. Of course, Mace agreed. The Chancellor has called a special hearing for this afternoon. It is scheduled to start in just a few hours. The entire Senate will be present. Excellent, Qui-Gon said. We do not want to give Senator Crote or the Cobral time to realize that their plan has failed, that we are all still very much alive. He briefly touched Lena's shoulder. And we can take care of this matter once and for all. It is best for Frego, I think. Lena nodded. In the meantime I'd like to freshen up and change my clothes. She gestured to her dirty travel clothing. I fear this is not appropriate for a special session of the Galactic Senate. Obi-Wan smiled. Even under extreme pressure, Lena attended to details. He would miss her when their mission was over, he realized. And it would be over, very soon. We have readied some chambers in the Fragan Consulate for you, May said. We believe that Senator Crote will be out of the building until the hearing. But if we run into him we must all behave as though we have not linked him to the Cobral in any way. I understand, Lena said. But I hope you are right when you say he is out of the building. Mace led the way to Lena's temporary quarters and the Jedi waited while she quickly freshened up and changed her clothes. Obi-Wan was amazed when she re-emerged a few minutes later. Her hair had been tied into an elaborate twist, and a pair of sparkling gem earrings dangled from her earlobes. A simple light blue gown hung just to her ankles. She looked lovely and not at all like she had been through a long, harrowing night. The group left the consulate and went directly to the Senate. Lena gasped when she entered the Senate chamber. I had no idea the galaxy was so big, she whispered to Obi-Wan nervously. Obi-Wan gave her a reassuring smile. You'll be fine, he whispered back. Remember, you are doing what is right. Lena squared her shoulders and nodded as the group took their place on the large floating platform. She took her seat as the platform smoothly glided toward the front of the giant chamber. The session was just beginning and senators from all over the galaxy were craning their heads to see who would be speaking at this special meeting. After a few minutes the murmur echoing throughout the room began to die down. Chancellor Valorum signaled to Lena that it was time for her to speak. Steadying herself on her chair, she got to her feet. For a moment she was silent as she looked out at the thousands of faces staring back at her. Obi-Wan could only guess at what was running through her mind. She had been through so much, come so far. Now her fate was in the hands of strangers. Would they believe her? Would they care? Lena's voice did not wobble as she spoke out about the Cobra. When she linked the crime family to Senator Crote there was a murmur in the chamber followed by respectful silence. Obi-Wan could tell Lena had the attention of every being in the room as she spoke of crimes, abused power, and the evil Cobra hold on Frago. Then she told her own story, including the death of her husband and cousin. And finally Senator Crate's attempt to have them all killed. There was an uproar in the chamber as a stunned Senator Crote leaped to his feet. You are lying, he shouted. I have done nothing but good for your planet. But Obi-Wan could tell by the look on the Senator's face, that the man knew the tide was against him, as Lena presented the proof, not only his link to the thug who had attacked her, but transmissions that linked him definitively with the destruction of the Daguerrean II. His political career, and in fact his life as a free man, was over. 
It did not take long to tally the vote. Senator Crote was removed from office, and the Cobral were immediately ordered under arrest to be tried for their crimes. Once a new government was in place, a new senator of Frago would be elected. Obi-Wan beamed. He was so proud of Lena, of all that she had accomplished for her planet and her people. Because of her, Frago would finally get its new beginning, its chance at a new life. Chapter 19 Back at the Fragan Consulate, a small party was going on in Lena's chambers. There was much talk of the success of the testimony, and the new road ahead. A few senators were so impressed by Lena's testimony, that they suggested she run for the Fragan senatorial position. I have no interest in such a position, she replied flatly. I will return to Frago to help put the transition government in place. But afterward, it will be time for me to start a new life, on a new planet. She winked at Obi-Wan, and he had a feeling that politics were definitely in Lena's future. Perhaps she would get a position as an aide of some sort on Coruscant. If she did, he realized, he might get to see her from time to time. After the small group had shared a celebratory meal together, Lena announced that she wanted to get some rest. So much has happened, and I'd like a little time to digest it all. Soon enough I'll be heading back to Frago. I'm afraid I won't be getting much rest there." Qui-Gon nodded. He knew how much work it was to change governments. I certainly think a rest is in order, he said. Jedi Master Mace Windu and I have temple business to attend to, but I will be back shortly. Obi-Wan can stay with you, if you like. That's very kind, but I'd really like some time alone," Lena replied graciously. Obi-Wan tried to hide his disappointment as he nodded. Of course, he said. While Mace and Qui-Gon left for the temple, Obi-Wan lingered outside Lena's door. He wanted to respect her wishes, but also wanted to stay close by in case she changed her mind. The door to the adjacent chamber was open and the room was empty. Obi-Wan entered and sat down in a comfortable chair. From here he could hear what was going on in Lena's room. Obi-Wan had just closed his eyes when he heard a familiar voice. It was not Lena's, and it was not friendly. Surprised to see me, Lena dear, it said. I suppose you would be. But then I thought you loved surprises. There was a muffled sound, as if the intruder was fiddling with some clothing. Then Obi-Wan heard Lena gasp. Obi-Wan was out in the hallway in less than a second. With his hand on his lightsaber, he pressed the door controls. But nothing happened. The door was jammed. Obi-Wan ignited his lightsaber. He'd have to cut through the door. But as his blade touched the entrance, something told him not to cut. Concentrating, he closed his eyes. He heard a very slight scraping right in front of him. Lena was just centimeters away, on the other side of the door. There was no way for him to cut through without putting her at risk. I should have done this years ago, the intruder continued. Perhaps then I could have saved my favorite son. The one I loved the most. The one I cherished. Zanita. I tried to save him, I really did. But once word got out that he wanted to betray the family, that you had talked him into testifying against his own flesh and blood, there was nothing I could do. It was a great loss for me, yes. But necessary. Lena let go of a sob. Necessary, she echoed in disbelief. Zanita, he was your own son. I know that, Lena. Actually, I rather wished he had been a daughter. You see, boys and men are nothing but foolish pawns. They always need to be told what to do, and half the time they still do it wrong. Things on Frago were a mess until I took control. I organized our forces and got the government to see matters our way. Everything was going just fine until you came along. You stole my Rutin's heart and coerced his mind. Rutin had a mind of his own, Lena said quietly. Scanning the wall, Obi-Wan tried to remember the position of everything inside the quarters. His hands were damp with sweat, and his heart was pounding. 
he didn't have much time to act, or any room for error. Zanita acted as if she didn't hear her daughter-in-law. And now because of you I stand to lose my other two sons as well, she went on. But of course I'm not going to let that happen. Obi-Wan heard an ominous click. He had to act. He just hoped he wasn't already too late. Raising his lightsaber, he pushed the blade into the wall. Would you like a moment to fix your hair, darling? Zanita asked. You might be seeing Ru Tin in a few moments. Obi-Wan sliced through the wall with remarkable speed, and stepped inside just in time to see Lena fall to the floor, meters away. She landed with a sickening thud and lay completely still. Still holding a blaster in her hand, Zanita leveled the barrel at her daughter-in-law's chest. She did not seem to be aware of Obi-Wan's presence. Obi-Wan tore his eyes away from Lena and took several steps toward Zanita. She whirled around suddenly, the blaster now aimed at him. Ah, a Jedi, she said. Of course. She fired several rapid blasts. Obi-Wan was surprised by her incredible accuracy, and had to dodge and weave to avoid being hit by two and deflect three of the bolts with his saber at the same time. Stepping forward, he felt one of the bolts graze his robe. He spun around and leaped into the air, landing on Zanita's right side and grabbing the blaster. Zanita hurled herself forward onto Lena's body. Her shoulders shook violently as several sobs escaped her throat. The true leader of the Cobral had been defeated, and was probably thinking of the time she would soon be spending in prison. Obi-Wan deactivated his lightsaber and reclipped it to his belt. There was a small hole in his robe where the blaster bolt had grazed him. He fingered it gingerly, grateful that he was not wounded. But Lena. All of a sudden, Obi-Wan heard a rushing sound behind him. Obi-Wan, look out, someone shouted. It was Qui-Gon. For a split second, Obi-Wan was not sure where to look. Then he saw the glimmer of a weapon, in Zanita's hand. It was a vibro blade. Before Obi-Wan could disarm her a second time, Zanita had plunged the reverberating blade into her chest. A moment later, she fell to the floor next to Lena, dead. Chapter 20 Qui-Gon looked up from his sleep couch, in his quarters at the Jedi Temple, to see his Padawan standing in the doorway. I thought you might like to come with me, to see Lena, he explained. Obi-Wan shifted his feet slightly, and Qui-Gon was reminded of the young boy he had taken as a Padawan learner, more than four years before. Impatient and headstrong, but also unsure. They had come a long way since then. But at that moment, Qui-Gon was very aware that the younger Jedi still sought his affection and approval. Qui-Gon could not blame him, and was even grateful. Soon enough, Obi-Wan would be a Jedi Knight in his own right, and would no longer need him. For the moment however, he was still a boy. Things between them had not been very smooth of late, Qui-Gon knew. He felt a twinge of guilt. He was not sure why it was so difficult for him to confide in the boy when it came to his feelings. Like many things, it simply was. I would like that, Qui-Gon said, getting to his feet. How is she doing? The blow to her head when she fell was quite severe, Obi-Wan replied. But she is recovering well and is set to be released this afternoon. She is planning to return to Frego, the day after tomorrow. Qui-Gon set his pace to match Obi-Wan's as they made their way down the corridor. Physical wounds heal quickly, he said quietly. It is the emotional ones that require more time. Qui-Gon was silent as they made their way down the hall. Then he spoke. When Tahal died, the wound was so broad, and so deep, that I was certain I could not live. I could not go on. And in my pain, I was blind to those around me. Those who also loved and mourned to Hull. I grieved her as well, Obi-Wan said. But I knew that my grief did not match yours, that it never would. I did not know how to help you. I was lost. Suddenly Qui-Gon stopped, and turned to face his Padawan. I am the one who was lost, Padawan. 
You were generous and patient with me. And I needed that patience. I still carry the wound I suffered when I lost to Hull. I will, for the rest of my life. Obi-Wan nodded, solemnly. I know, he said softly. Qui-Gon placed a hand on Obi-Wan's shoulder. I am grateful for your efforts to help me through my pain. For a long time, I was not ready to hear your words, but you were still right to speak them. Thanks to you, I have found myself again. I have found a way to go on. Your words, you are a comfort to me, thank you. Obi-Wan let out a deep breath, and smiled. You're welcome, he said. End of story. We hope you have enjoyed this audiobook presentation. Please visit our YouTube channel, YJK Audiobooks, for other exciting stories. Also, if you enjoy the audiobooks we create, please consider supporting the expense of our projects through our Patreon page. Those who do so have access to exclusive book series, are able to download the MP3 files for all books we create, and also have early access to our normal YouTube releases. For more details please visit, patreon.com, slash, yjk, audiobooks. The link is also available in the video description below. And now, please enjoy a preview of our Patreon exclusive book series, Rebel Force. Star Wars Rebel Force Book 6 Uprising Written by Alex Wheeler Audiobook Adaptation by YJK Audiobooks Preview While on a secret mission to the planet Naimari, Luke Skywalker is contacted by the Imperial Commander, Rezi Sorish. Sorish demands that Luke surrender himself, or he will destroy a ship full of innocent civilians. Now, Luke must risk everything to stop Sorish, once and for all. Chapter 1 The moon was dead. A film of red dust lay over the cratered land. Nothing disturbed the still, acrid air. There was no sound, there was no movement. There was only scorched, flat ground, stretching to the bare horizon. If life had flourished here once, that time was long over. Erased. All traces of creature or creation, wiped out. Gone. And so there was no one to see the bright star that skimmed across the horizon, nearly invisible in the light of the rising sun. There was no one to understand that the star was a ship, circling the moon. Its first visitor in millennia. Certainly, there was no one to recognize the Ion Trail as that of a rusty old cloak-shaped fighter. Unseen, the cloak shape orbited the moon, spiraling closer and closer to the thin atmosphere. And inside, Commander Rezi Sorish, former Imperial Commander, current fugitive, stared blindly into space. And waited, to die. 27 days, 16 hours, and 4 minutes. That was how long he'd been waiting. Ever since Darth Vader had convinced the Emperor he was a traitor, Rezi Sorish had been on the run. He snorted. On the run. What a joke. On the crawl, was more like it. Hobbling from one star system to the next. Creeping through the shadows. Desperately scrounging for food, for shelter, for ships. One month before, he had been one of the most powerful men in the galaxy. Then he'd been blamed for the disaster on Belazura, even though it hadn't been his mistake that got the Imperial garrison destroyed. The ambush of the rebels should have worked. Would have worked, if it hadn't been for the Jedi scum. And even so, it wasn't his fault. Darth Vader had twisted the facts, convinced the Emperor that Sorish was incompetent, maybe even a traitor. All because Vader was jealous of Sorish's power. If Sorish hadn't had a backup escape plan, he would be dead. But life wasn't worth much anymore. Thanks to the rebel vermin and the vengeful Dark Lord, 
Sorish was nothing. Less than nothing. He was prey. There were those who believed that the galaxy was teeming with life. Fools. The galaxy was a vast and empty wasteland, small outposts of civilization sprinkled through trillions of kilometers of void. Rezi Sorish was no fool, he knew how to use the emptiness. He knew how to hide. But Vader was no fool either, and Sorish had never expected to survive this long. Gradually, as he drifted aimlessly through the wilds of the Outer Rim, something had changed in him. Something had awoken, something he'd never expected to have again, hope. Perhaps he was as smart as he'd thought. Perhaps Vader wasn't as powerful as he'd feared. Perhaps he had a chance to save himself, and reclaim his rightful position at the Emperor's side. To get revenge on his enemies. He had stumbled upon this moon by chance, but perhaps it was destiny. Sorish dropped altitude and skimmed over the arid land, surveying his new home. It would take time to build a new base of power. It would take resources. But he had ample amounts of both. There were still sources he could risk trusting, secrets he could use to manipulate, to blackmail, to obtain what he needed. As one of the Emperor's most valued advisors, he'd been trusted with a large discretionary fund. Over the years, Sorish had siphoned the money into more than a hundred accounts. He had cultivated a cadre of underlings who would be loyal only to him. He had collected black market information, and knew more about his enemies than they knew about themselves. For one standard month, he had lived as a dead man, afraid to risk any contact with his old life. But living in fear, drifting through nowhere, endlessly waiting, it was no better than death. And it was no longer tolerable. As always, he would be patient, and he would be careful. Sorish knew how his enemies saw him. They thought he was a narrow man, cowardly, paranoid, more comfortable with a data pad than a blaster. They were right. But they failed to understand that these were not weaknesses, they were his greatest strengths. In the end, they would allow him to rise, from the nearly dead. They would allow him, to strike back. He would take them all down, all his enemies. All the ones responsible for stranding him here, in this brutal no man's land. He didn't have a plan. Not yet. But he knew where his revenge would begin. He would start with the one, who had started it all. The man who had been the beginning, of Sorish's end. Luke, Skywalker. Chapter 2 Did you say something, Luke whispered. What part of quiet, don't you understand, Han Solo hissed. I thought I heard my name, Luke said. Well, maybe you should think a little more quietly, Han snarled. Chewbacca growled at them. Luke shut his mouth. When a Wookiee carrying a giant bowcaster shushes you, you take his advice. Especially when he's the only thing standing between you, and a room full of soldiers with blasters. Luke sighed. Back on Yavin 4, this had sounded like such an easy mission. Go to the Royal Palace of Naimari, grab the Duchess's access codes for the Naimari Imperial Military Installation, get out. He didn't understand how it had all gone so wrong, so fast. Much less, how he and Han had ended up crammed into a shoe closet, with only a thin curtain of Dramashian shimmer silk separating them from the Duchess's guards. A thin curtain and, of course, Chewbacca, who was posing as a guard himself. Apparently, to most Nyamarians, all Wookiees looked alike. As usual, Han had been determined to blast his way out of trouble, but Luke and Leia had convinced him to wait. Their orders were to infiltrate, sight unseen. And Leia had insisted they follow orders. Of course, that was before Leia set off to explore the west wing of the palace while Han and Luke took the north and south. She should have rendezvoused with them an hour before, but there was no sign of her. Luke tried not to worry. Leia could take care of herself. Still, do you think we should go find her?" Luke whispered. Han smiled crookedly. If I know the princess. There was a deafening crash and explosion of plaster as a sleek black airspeeder barreled straight through the wall. 
The room erupted in chaos as guards fled from the oncoming speeder. Laser fire from its forward cannons peppered the room, blasting holes in antique wallpaper, the clary crystalline vases, and several dozen shoe boxes. She'll find us, Han finished, as he burst out of the shoe closet, blaster blazing. What are you waiting for, Leia cried, urging them into the speeder. White plaster dust coated her braided brown hair. Luke, Han, and Chewbacca piled in. A phalanx of guards poured into the room. Laser bolts screamed through the air. We have to get out of here, Luke shouted over the noise of battle. He whirled around to send a stream of laser fire at their pursuers. The speeder lifted off the ground. Thanks for the brilliant idea. Leia aimed the speeder straight for the giant transparisteel window. Duck. Luke cradled his head and braced for impact. A shower of transparisteel rained down on them as they hurtled into open air. Two stories below, a fleet of royal speeder bikes lifted off the ground and gave chase. Leia increased thrust, and they shot forward at 650 km per hour. I thought you wanted us to do this quietly, Han shouted over the engine roar. Change of plans. Leia jerked the stolen speeder hard to the right, tipping so precariously they nearly toppled out of the vehicle. She wove skillfully through the maze of skyscrapers, blasting through buildings when she couldn't go around them. The royal guards were determined, but they couldn't match Leia's piloting skills. You complaining? Not today, Han teased. Feel free to let yourself out, Leia snapped. Han stretched out in the seat, hands behind his head. I'm fine right where I am, your worship. You can rescue me any day of the week. He coughed loudly, adding under his breath, especially when it's your fault we needed rescuing in the first place. Excuse me, Leia said. I said. Chewbacca cut Han off with a loud roar. Luke gave the Wookiee a friendly slap on the back. I'm with Chewbacca, he said. How about we escape now, argue later? Or never, he added silently. After months of crisscrossing the galaxy with Han and Leia, he was ready for a break. In that case, I suggest you hold on. Leia yanked the controls to the right, angling them on a collision course with a 30-story tower. Luke clung to his seat as Leia pulled back hard. The speeder lurched into a vertical climb, hugging the side of the building. Far below, Imperial speeder bikes skidded and smashed into Duracrete as they made clumsy attempts to follow. Leia ignored them. She hunched over the controls, eyes laser-focused on the narrow course ahead of her. There was little for Luke to do but admire her graceful flying as she steered them through the city-sized obstacle course. Their remaining pursuers quickly fell behind, lost in a forest of duracrete and transparisteel. Soon they were alone in the sky, emerging from the dense city center into an empty stretch of land at the fringe of the capital. The Millennium Falcon was parked at a hangar only a few kilometers away. Now, Leia said to Han, relaxing her grip on the controls once the danger had passed, I'd like you to explain exactly how this was all my fault. You were the one who tripped the silent alarm. Only because you were the one who tripped over your own two feet, and knocked me into it. Are you calling me clumsy? Of course not. I'm calling you a clumsy, blaster-brained nerf herder. Luke sighed, and leaned back in his seat. It was going to be a long ride home. Anam, the capital city of Naimari, was home to the most modern, architecturally sophisticated spaceport in the Meridian sector. Han refused to take the Millennium Falcon within a hundred kilometers of it. Instead, he docked the ship at the South Anam spaceport. It was little more than a large warehouse, built in the no man's land where the city bled into the desert. Its equipment and fixtures hadn't been replaced or repaired in three decades. These days, no one bothered to use it but grizzled spacers, smugglers, and any other unsavory characters with shadowy business on Naimari. In other words, it was Han's kind of place. Lai Prini, a Nymerian who'd been fixing up ships at South Anam spaceport for years, owed Han a favor. 
and he'd sworn on his life that he'd take care of the Millennium Falcon. But Han didn't trust anyone to take care of his ship, especially not a Nymerian who'd sell out his own mother for a bottle of lum. The Falcon might not look like much, with her crumbling shield projectors and wonky power generators, but treat her right and she'd be your best friend. She was the fastest ship in the galaxy, and Han never felt quite right when she was out of his sight. But as they approached the main hangar, things felt less right than usual. It wasn't anything specific. Just a certainty, in his gut, that something was wrong. And Han always trusted his gut, that was why he was still alive. The hairs on the back of his neck stood on their ends. Shadows flickered at the corners of his vision. He swore he heard footsteps behind them, but every time he spun around, the street was clear. Calm down, Leia said. Your precious ship isn't going anywhere. What is it, Han? Luke asked, sounding concerned. Say what you wanted about the kid and his Jedi hokum, Luke understood gut feelings. But Han shook his head. If he was right, and yet another bounty hunter was on his tail, that wasn't Luke's problem. Luke wasn't the one who double-crossed the biggest, ugliest, meanest hut this side of the galactic core. Han had been fending off Jabba's minions for months, and he wasn't about to let another one ruin his day. Didn't expect to see you back so soon, Lyprini said, as soon as he caught sight of Han. The Nymerian scurried over, looking shifty and up to no good. But there was nothing unusual about that. Didn't expect to see me back at all, you mean, Han said. He knew Lai Prini wanted the Falcon for himself. In fact, Han was half convinced that Prini had been the one to tip off the Duchess that they were infiltrating the palace. Might have been a better plan, the Nymerian hissed, leaning in close. Han gagged on Prini's thick, putrid breath. It smelled like a rotting bantha carcass. Someone's been looking for you. Looking for us, Luke said nervously. Who? But Han was unsurprised, his gut was never wrong. Was it that Fargool bounty hunter slug, he asked. You'd think he learned his lesson back on Iridonia. Preeny shook his head. Just some glimfid. Offered a big bounty if anyone could point him toward the crew of the Falcon. And what did you tell him, Leia asked. Told him I never heard of you, Preeny said. Chewbacca growled and took a step closer to the Nymerian. A big step. Okay, okay, Prini squeaked. I may have told him you were in town. But I didn't say you were coming back today, I swear. Only because you didn't know, Han growled. Forget him, Leia said. Let's get out of here before whoever it is comes back. Better idea, Han said, drawing his blaster out of its holster. Let's stick around. Han. Luke tapped the pouch containing the stolen access codes, a reminder that they had more important things to do. Don't give me that look, kid, Han said wearily. They were exactly the same, Luke and Leia. Always telling him to stop, think, wait. Be patient. Well, now it was their turn, to be patient. It was past time to send a message to Jabba. And Han decided this glimfid, was just the guy to deliver it. Chapter 3 Leia, wanted to throttle Han. As usual. He was acting like they hadn't just spent three days on the run. Like there was no rush to get the access codes off the planet and back to Yavin 4, much less get themselves off the planet, before the Duchess's forces figured out where they were. How did I get here, Leia asked herself, not for the first time. Once, the Rebel Alliance had been her only priority. Destroying the Empire had been all she cared about. Then, out of nowhere, Luke and Han had dropped into her life. Destroying the Empire still mattered, but so did they. Which was why, fuming, she followed Han out of the hangar and back into the alleyways of Anum. Good friends were hard to find, and even harder to ignore when they were about to do something stupid. This way, Han hissed, stepping over a heap of rotting acid beets. I think I saw the guy slip around the corner. Chewbacca's tracking skills, and Han's gut, 
guided them through the maze of narrow streets. The pavement was cracked and uneven, frequently giving way to rubble. Leia couldn't believe how different this area was from the dense city center, with its glossy, crystalline skyscrapers. There, everything had been smooth and silver. Here, every building was a patchwork of bright colors and mismatched materials. Market stalls dotted each corner, hawking forelo berries, crate dragon skin pouches, and small poor stone statues of the Duchess. The rich, sweet scent of roasting ham bones choked the air. In the city center, speeders jockeyed for space at death-defying speeds. But here, the only traffic was a line of sallow creatures that looked like lumpy, bloated Eopi, and the occasional wild pack of roaming Vurpax. As for the alien they were tailing, more than once, Leia caught a glimpse of a long proboscis or scaled leg disappearing around a corner. But it was always too quick to be caught, too slow to escape them completely. Something was wrong. But Han wouldn't be stopped. He led them into a cramped alleyway, zigzagging through heaping dumpsters. The heavy stink of rotting garbage was overwhelming. Leia held her breath, walking faster and faster until she was nearly running. She pushed past Han and exploded out of the alley, drawing in a desperate breath of clean air. She nearly choked on it when she spotted the glimpit standing only a few meters away, his finger extended toward Han. Found you, the glimpid hissed. The alien was tall and thin, with tan, scaly limbs and suction cups at the end of each narrow finger and toe. Red eyes peered out over a long, sharp snout. Worst mistake you ever made, Han drawled. They had landed in a dusty, disused plaza. A decrepit fountain sat in the middle, spigots dry and rusting. They were completely alone with the glimpid. Leia was suddenly sure, that was no accident. Now, you go back to Jabba, N. I have something for you, the alien interrupted, rushing toward them on gangly legs. Wait, he yelped, freezing as three blasters and a bowcaster were leveled at him. The alien raised his hands in the air. It's just a message. I don't even have weapons. You can search me. Jabba sent me a message, Han asked. Not you, the glimpid said. Him. He extended a long, suction-tipped finger, toward Luke. Without thinking, Leia stepped in between Luke and the glimpid. What do you want with him, she asked. Him, Han said, eyes wide. His head swiveled back and forth between Luke and the alien. You sure it's him? The glimpid pulled out a data pad. The human traveling with the Millennium Falcon, pale hair, low intelligence. Hey, Luke exclaimed. Han snorted. Leia shoved him. Answers to the name of Luke. That's you all right, kid, Han said grudgingly. I've been looking for you for a long time, the glimpid said. And it's worth a big reward for me if you just listen to this message. He thrust a hollow chip and small hollow player in Luke's face. What do you think, Luke asked. Leia narrowed her eyes at the glimpid. We need more information before we can. Let me see that. Han seized the equipment. Before Leia could stop him, he shoved the chip into the player and switched it on. A shadowy, translucent figure appeared before them, his face masked by a hood. Luke Skywalker, we finally meet. Who is that, Luke said, staring at the hooded man. He turned to the alien. Who sent you? Taking advantage of their distraction, the glimpid was creeping away. Han clamped a hand on his shoulder, and dug a blaster into his back. Not so fast, buddy. How about you stick around while we watch this? Then you're going to answer all our questions. I don't know anything, the alien squeaked. I swear. I've been hunting you for a long time, the mysterious figure said. His voice was narrow and pinched. I believe you know a friend of mine, X-7. Leia gasped. X-7 had been a skilled assassin hired to kill Luke, and he'd nearly succeeded, more than once. X-7 had been dead for months, but the man who sent him was still out there. 
Rezi Sorish, the imperial commander who devoted himself to destroying Luke. Apparently he hadn't given up. Meeting you proved rather inconvenient for him, the man continued. Hopefully, our encounter will end more happily. For me, at least. Now, down to business. He clapped his hands together sharply. His hologram faded into a harsh red landscape of rocks and craters. The camera settled on a group of twenty people, huddled together behind a fence bristling with electric current. Men and women held each other. Small children clung to their mother's knees. Their faces all bore the same expression, terror. These are some of the passengers of the Arcanian ship, Endeavor. Settlers, 100 men, women, and children, headed for a new life on a new world. I'm afraid I forced them to take a slight detour. I'm sure they're eager to get on their way again, and they can. As soon as you deliver yourself to me. At the end of this hollow recording, you'll find a set of galactic coordinates. You have 12 standard hours to reach them, or I promise you, all my guests will die an extremely painful death. You will not tell anyone else about this. If you disobey these instructions, the poor settlers will die. The camera zoomed in on a small child's face, his muddy cheeks streaked with tears. All of them. The hooded figure wagged a finger at them. Leia kept her eyes fixed on Luke. She could imagine how he felt. Whenever she closed her eyes at night, she still saw herself on the bridge of the Death Star, watching her beloved Alderaan on the view screen. Giving Vader and Governor Tarkin what they wanted hadn't helped, even though she'd told only a half-truth. It hadn't stopped them from proceeding with their effective demonstration. It hadn't saved Alderaan. She knew what it meant to have all those lives in your hands, and to be unable to save them. It didn't matter how many people told you it wasn't your fault. It didn't matter if you knew, logically, there was nothing you could have done. If anything happened to those settlers, Luke would never forgive himself. Leia knew that better than anyone. Don't think that you can disobey me just because I'm halfway across the galaxy, the man said. As of now, I'm watching you. And my reach is further than you might expect. Perhaps you'd appreciate a little demonstration. But he didn't move. He didn't do anything. Impressive, Han sneered. And then the Glymphid screamed. What did you do to him, Leia cried. Nothing, Han shouted, as the alien began shaking in Han's grasp. He dropped to the ground, jerking and twitching. His eyes rolled back in his head. Snorts of pain exploded from his snout. We have to help him, Luke exclaimed. He knelt by the alien's side, but there was nothing he could do. A racking shudder tore through the Glymphid's body. A long, low sigh wheezed out of his lungs, and then, nothing. Luke pressed his ear against the alien's still chest, then rose, looking somber. He's gone. Explain to me again what we're doing here, Loon Davinian said, hoisting a load of Duracrete blocks over his shoulder. The Yavin 4 sun was beating down with unusual strength. Sweat matted his shirt to the back of his neck. We're offering crucial assistance to the effort to destroy the Empire, Ferris Olin reminded him. We're building freshers, Div argued. Not exactly heroic labor. Ferris lowered himself down to the ground with a soft grunt. All labor is heroic, he said. But the words rang slightly hollow. His muscles ached with the strain of the heavy lifting. Even his bones ached. It was tempting to call upon the force to help ease the job along. But they were working on a heavily trafficked path. Anyone could pass by and catch him calling on his old Jedi skills. Ferris couldn't risk it. When you suckered me into joining up with this rebellion, this isn't exactly the kind of work I had in mind, Div complained. It wasn't what Ferris had in mind either. After hiding out for two decades, he was eager to act. It had been a hard decision to join the rebellion, as he couldn't risk anything interfering with his primary mission, protecting Leia. But in the end, there was no real choice. If he didn't do everything in his power to destroy the Empire, 
he wouldn't be able to live with himself. And he knew Div felt the same. Which didn't mean he'd signed up for refresher building. It's going to take them a while to trust us, Ferris said. Surely you can understand that. They had both seen what happened when a rebellion trusted too much, too fast. That made it all too easy for enemies to slip under the radar and ruin everything. I just don't see how this is helping anyone, Div said. If we told them what we could do. We can't, Ferris said. You know that. The rebels weren't the only ones slow to trust. No one could know that Div had once been a force-sensitive child, groomed to be a Jedi. As no one could know that Ferris had grown up in the Jedi Temple, training with the great Obi-Wan Kenobi in Yoda himself. Besides, just because they want to keep us out of the loop doesn't mean we need to let them. He spied a scruffy redhead making his way through the woods, and flagged him down. Jono Moroni spent most of his time on the rebel base doing janitorial work, alongside the droids. He was a quiet man who kept to himself, and few people seemed to even notice him. But Ferris's Jedi Masters had long ago taught him the value of silent observers. Jono faded into the background, which meant he saw more than people knew. And he wasn't unwilling to pass it along. Good afternoon, Jono, Ferris called out. How goes it? Couldn't be better, Jono said. Over the last few weeks, Ferris had grown to truly respect the man. He was unfailingly friendly and cheerful. It was clear nothing made him happier than serving the rebellion. And it turned out that he was only quiet because no one ever bothered to speak to him. Once you got him going, he could talk for hours. Ferris peppered him with questions about the weather, and his recent bout of Balmora flu. Gradually, he moved the conversation in the direction he needed it to go. Things must be busy over at Masasi Station, given what's going on now. It was a safe question, things were always busy at the Rebel Base Station. Jono nodded eagerly. Course, I shouldn't talk about it. But Ferris needed him to talk about it. And so he reached out with the Force, and loosened Jono's tongue. You'd like to tell us about it, Ferris suggested pleasantly. I'd like to tell you about it, Jono echoed in a fuzzy voice. Div looked disgusted. It was one thing to use the force against one's enemies. Using it to wring information from a friend. Surely that wasn't the Jedi way. But Ferris wouldn't allow himself to feel guilty. He couldn't help the rebels unless he knew what help they needed. Still, such decisions were easier to make in the old days. As a Jedi Padawan it had been simple to know the right thing to do. Right was whatever his master told him it was. Only after leaving the temple had Ferris learned the joy of deciding such things for himself. But, like all true joys, it came with a healthy dose of terror. Div knew that too, in his own way. Could be I heard something, while I was mopping up, Jono said hesitantly. Ferris gave him an encouraging nod. Rebel scouts intercepted an encrypted Imperial transmission, Jono confided. The Imperial High Command is having some kind of top-secret meeting in a few weeks, out in the middle of nowhere. Emperor's going. Darth Vader too. And because they're doing it in secret, they're traveling light. Only a couple Star Destroyers. Sounds like General Dodonna thinks this could be our chance to take down the Empire, all in one shot. Div scowled. Great. A top-secret mission to take out the Emperor and Vader, and you know where we'll be? Building freshers. Ferris frowned, but for a different reason. Thank you, Jono. Always good to talk to you. Now it might be nice for you to go back to your quarters and lie down for a bit. Jono furrowed his brow, looking slightly confused. Kind of hot out here, he said. Think I might head back to my quarters and lie down for a bit. Sounds like a good idea. Ferris said. I'm sorry, friend, he thought, as Jono wended his way through the forest and disappeared into the trees. You deserve better. But he'd learned something, possibly something crucial. What do you think, Ferris asked Div. I think we're wasting our time out here when we could be. No, Ferris said impatiently. 
It was growing harder and harder to remember the sweet, young boy Loon Davinian had once been. He'd grown into a hardened, cynical young man. A good man, but often, it seemed like he wanted to pretend that goodness didn't exist. Much as he wanted to pretend that his connection to the Force no longer existed. Ferris could understand that. When you'd had great power as a child, only to watch it disappear as you grew, it was tempting to forget you ever had it at all. Ferris had spent many years trying to rebuild his connection to the Force, but he knew he would never regain all he'd lost. Put aside your impatience and your bitterness. Take a moment. What do you think about what we've just learned? What do you feel? Div sighed with irritation, but he did as he was told. He closed his eyes, and bowed his head. When he looked up, a few moments later, his eyes were bright and clear. Something's off, he said. But I can't put my finger on it. That kind of information, just falling into the rebellion's lap. I agree, Ferris said. It's almost too easy. We are due for some good luck, Div pointed out. Not likely, Ferris mused. It would be nice to believe that the galaxy had finally smiled upon the rebellion. But doubt nodded him. Something felt very wrong about this news. A great pressure seemed to weigh down on him, as if the dark side was settling on Yavin 4, thickening the air, spreading its poison. Maybe it's time for us to get out, Div said. You think something bad's coming, I can tell. Seems like a good time to get out, while the getting's good. Go save the galaxy from somewhere else. You don't mean that, Ferris said. Div opened his mouth, but shut it again, before arguing. We've got some time, Ferris said. We can figure this out. And if it's a trap? Then we do whatever we have to do, to keep the rebels from flying straight into it, Ferris said, hoping he sounded more confident than he felt. He told himself there was no reason for the dark chasm of hopelessness, that had opened within him. At least the princess is far away from here, Ferris reassured himself. Whatever happens, she'll be safe. End of chapter This book is part of our exclusive series available to Patreon supporters. If you would like to listen to this entire book, please visit patreon.com slash yjk audiobooks. The link is also available in the video description below. Thank you for listening, and may the force be with you, always.